I'll try that again. Good morning, everyone. It's like a class, isn't it? Good morning, uh, principal. <laughs> we are all present. Thank you so much. Um, it gives me great pleasure, and thank you so much, Prof. Davidson, for the, um, you know, for uh, inviting me to give a few words of opening. I must apologize in advance because today we have Senex, and it starts around nine. So I, I really wanted to be part of this session, but. Um, uh, and that's why I was complaining about having a link because, you know, when you're virtual, I can do it both at the same time. Like, you know, uh, once in a while when there's some boring conversations, I can join. But don't report me on that one, Prof. Davidson. I, um, I must also thank the organizers, the organizing team. I know uh, with all the emails to and from, uh, you know, for organizing this event and especially our partners today, uh, you know, the Department of Science and Innovation, um, uh, the, the South African Space Agency, and also the, um, I think it's the air traffic and um, navigation, navigation uh, s system services. services. Yeah, not system. Uh, you know, I, I'm saying that because yesterday I was actually flying and I was thinking about what was I going to talk about today. So I was going to show you some, some of the pictures of um, me trying to fly a plane. I've never flown one before, but uh, yesterday I managed. Uh, I know Joe won't believe me. So I'm Those are the only ones you're allowed to see for today uh, because I, I, I wanted to have an idea of what we talk about, you know, when we say that uh, uh, we, we are looking at these navigation, you know, um, uh, satellite systems, we are looking at, you know, why it's important to have safe space, why it's important to know what traffic and congestion can do in the airspace. So I think it's very important for us. So you might not know most of you. In fact, in Deben, we have a very nice uh, flying school. It's Focus Air, one of them in Deben North. And we are trying to set up some short programs with them, you know, to see how we can best collaborate. Because I also think that for engineering students, even if you're not going to be a pilot, but those who work on the ground as ground staff, the people repair aircraft as well, it's, it's actually good to have an idea of how the aircraft actually works, which I think is very important. So for me, I'm really excited in terms of what I can share about DUT. Um, this is just for our colleagues who may not be at the university and our colleagues from UKZN whom I must also recognize who are present, our partners. Um, uh, we, we are located in KZN and we have over 33,000 students. So in many cases, uh, we contribute quite a bit to the local economy, the social uh, economic transformation of KZN itself and the country um, in terms of training. Because you find that out of these 33,000 who graduate annually about six to 8,000 students per year, and a lot of those end up unemployed. And um, for us, I think it's important as a university to ask ourselves why is this the case? What can we do to make sure that our graduates are able to uh, find, not just find work, but also create work opportunities and also create other work streams, you know, um, just as COVID happened, some of the skills are phasing out of the, you know, of the economy. There are some skills which you don't really need anymore. I always say, like, for example, I know we all rely heavily on our peers and so forth, but uh, actually the technology, the way it is now, you can actually book your own timetable. You don't need to tell somebody to put it in your diary. Actually, it's better if you manage it yourself, then you might have less crisis. The only risk is that when nobody knows where you are, and then maybe the PA can find you. <laughs> so I think there are these other jobs which we can create um, and look at other opportunities. Uh, current at the university, we have 709 academics and 30% of those have PhDs. So you can imagine that the other area we are looking at is really capacity building to try and create a pool of people who have doctorates who can also help us with training the other, the next generation. The, the gap that we have in the system, by the way, is that even though we train people, most of the training is really based within the university. It's very theoretical. When you go out there, it's very different. I used to teach, I know, with, together with Joe. We joined some years ago. Before he left, by the way, he was here. We came at the same time. We were in the same group. Uh, very good colleagues, so it was good to see him today. I didn't know he was at DUT, so I'll probably invite you, Prof, and him for some uh, discussion of what we can do. Your partner's already here. Uh, he used to be a very good partner in crime. I, I'm, <laughs> I'm surprised he came back after we did a lot of crime. So, But thank you so much. Yeah, it's good to see you. But that having that industry experience for engineers and other subjects as well is very important for our students, the exposure. So that's why I value this uh, 
uh, relationship we have with our you know, um, partners as well to give us that opportunity. So the space science research and its location within the national strategy, there are a number of documents which talk to uh, space science research, but it is also linked to the National Development Plan 2030, and uh, which recognizes the value of science, technology, and innovation, as well as the white paper in science, which was approved in 2019. And this paper was driven so much by the Department of Science and Innovation. Um, and the Depart Department of Science and Innovation is actually committed to strengthening research and innovation competences and programs that can form the strategic foundation of scientific innovation. By the way, these statements to someone in the street don't mean anything if, for example, they do see a university, they do see people at the university and they can't see the direct benefit. So for us, when we talk about you know, being um, an engaged university that is promoting science, technology, and innovation, we want to see products and commercializable products which can help to improve and to create other work streams. So the National Space Science Strategy uh, talks about, for example, um, and if you are working in this area, you should know about this. You will find it on the website. I've put a link there. Um, it is meant to promote peaceful use of space, and this was very evident yesterday. For example, when I saw that where we were, there was a helicopter which was quite close, and because it was my first lesson, um, the, 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 the co-pilot said to me, move to the right. So the difference is for those of you who drive, you know, if you're driving a car to move to the right, you turn your steering to the right. But you also have to press at the same time the, hand, the, the, the pedal on your right in order for the plane to go right. And if you do it very fast, you can probably go in the deep. And because these planes are very small, uh, the wind, you know, the wind also plays a, a big, um, um, what do you say, role in pushing you to the direction where you don't want to go. So I actually was praying yesterday that, you know, I didn't know if I was going to be alive for this session, but uh, everything went well eventually. So um, I think the use of space, regulating uh, that use, uh, supporting the creation of an environment conducive to industrial development in space technology, and we can see the congestion on the roads that we have, and quite a number of things which we can do using the space um, uh, space and also trying to create another economy which can help us just, just uh, rather than just relying on our main roads and relying on um, um, the train system which we haven't really developed to its magnitude in Africa as well. And then foster research in space science and communications, navigation and space physics, and then advanced uh, scientific engineering and technological competences in space related activities. This would help us ensure that South Africa has a considerable share of the global space market, which generates a lot of billions. So for those of you who've done research, looking at the economy of just what uh, space research and space economy can bring to, to the fore in terms of um, creating new jobs and opportunities, and also tourism, promoting uh, goods exchange and so forth, you'll find that uh, that makes a significant um, role. Um, we as Africans are not very good at manufacturing, and uh, manufacturing is one of the areas which is also laid there. I don't know if you know any African state that designs planes at the moment. I know at the university we have a, a group in um, molded plastics, which some years ago they used to try and um, you know, do some uh, strength of materials for some of the parts. But the thing is that it would be good to see one day within our own continent, within South Africa, for us to produce some of the aircraft rather than just rely on Europe exporting to the continent as well. So the key strategic partnerships and roles we have as, as the university is the Department of Science and Innovation, the South African Space Agency, which I just mentioned now, and then the Air Traffic and Navigation Services, and then uh, DUT and other universities, including UKZN and a number of universities of technology as well, which are involved in this area. It is well aligned. The university strategy also talks to both the National Development Plan as well as the um, uh, Space Science Strategy. So you see in our strategy, we do talk about a number of areas, and I'm not going to go through them. I just put this here for information. Um, we have four strategic areas we focus on in terms of stewardship, systems and processes, sustainability and society. On the left hand side, you read from the bottom. And in this, you see that uh, all these circles that I'm putting have to do with something about innovation, creativity, innovation, creativity, innovation, which is repeated a few times. And for us to achieve this strategy, we know that we have to partner, and I've shown you the partners if, uh, that are relevant for the space science research team. 
And what we want to do as an engaged anchor institution within our region, again, I said that to people in the street, the university doesn't mean nothing. Actually, for most of us, I don't know how many of you are able to explain to your grandmother or your mother or your father what you do uh, when you're at university. So if you say, I'm doing space science research, are you able to break down what that is? If your grandmother said, oh, yes, you're doing, uh, what are you doing, a PhD, right? Are you a master's or PhD? Yeah, so uh, what's your topic? Yeah, so now just imagine the way she's explained it. So your grandmother, so what is that? I mean, what does it mean to them? And you know, there are many taxpayers in the country, and you'll be surprised. I don't know if some of you have seen the quote from um, Gabby. I don't know who sent it to me, where he talks about, um, you know, the different levels. So the people become politicians, right? I think the most intelligent people, I don't know if they're intelligent. I still have reservations about that, Prof. Um, they'll become engineers, medical doctors, and so forth. Then there's another group which becomes lawyers or something. And then there's a third group of people who are really not good dropouts in school, or maybe they've even went to school, become witch doctors, and what else do they become? <laughs> witch doctors and what? Politicians. Politicians. And then everybody listens. Oh, okay, no, no, this, uh, this other group, by the way, the dropouts and others become politicians, but there's a last group which doesn't even go to school. They become witch doctors, and everybody including the first class, second class, third class, have to listen to them. Well, it, it was Mugabe's quote. Um, if you Google it, you might find it. Um, he talks about that. So, so and, and you wonder, you know, these are the people who went to school. But in the end, we all rely on each other. I mean, I'm just trying to say that because at the end of the day, yes, it's good to have an education to be excellent. But if we don't play a role in transforming the lives of those around us, then it's, um, the role of the university becomes diminished. Remember the taxes come from the politicians whom we call. Most of you will be sitting there and complaining, oh, Zuma this, Zuma that. But actually he became president. You are an engineer, you never became president. So he must be very smart in some. Um, if we are able to bring all these key players together as a university, then they might start buying in in some of our interests. Because remember, we have to use their taxes to, to run our, our, our research and our training. So this is important in terms of making sure that um, we are able to have friends of the university, but also that people can identify with what happens and the value that adds to their lives and how that transforms them. So being able to uh, co uh, contribute to socioeconomic development uh, and um, the transformation agenda through community engagement and um, other activities that we can do around skills training and mentorship, and then being also able to contribute to knowledge production. And for me, knowledge production is not just publications, but it's also products, services that you can improve. The smart grids area, for example, look at now, the, I, I was so jealous to hear that uh, you guys have, uh, uh, when the lights go, you guys have in your department, professor has power, and we don't have power. Why can't you distribute it to the rest of us in the university? So. We, at the cost, yes, you can make money from us. So anyway, so um, you know those kinds of things can benefit the rest of us as well. So we are really proud to have such good work taking place um, within them. Here yeah, I just wanted to flag again, you know, these are the students, for example, the publications which have got DUT affiliation across the globe. And I was looking at this period, I think, which was from 2018 to 2020. You can see most of our collaborations are outside the continent. And what we are trying to do, even through the space science research, is increase collaborations within the continent as well. Uh, because we believe this is our market where we can actually grow and make a big difference. Even if you come up with new technologies, new products, you really want to uh, reach that market. Um, this is just uh, as a university in terms of the knowledge production, which uh, ranks us fifth at the moment in terms of the usage of the citations in the country. We do rank fifth, but globally, I think we've moved to 12th position, mainly because there were about 600 other universities that took part in the global rankings this year and that moved us down. I also wanted to just flag for you the unemployment rates, which are quite high. So I think when you're doing this type of work, it's important to think about what you can do to create other work streams for others and what training you can contribute. We have a lot of people with, uh, who are finishing, the, the next group finishing matric. We've got people with PhDs. Uh, we've got architects who can't find jobs. Actually, yesterday, just somebody was asking me. We've got these uh, graduates from university 
architectures? Is there something that they can do? So I would like to think about, you know, what can we do? You know, um, I, I know that they've graduated with another degree, but what can we do that can help them to, to be useful, yeah? Because they're not useless as they are, but uh, we, not, we need to find other work streams as well, uh, possibly for our youth. And where we want to be really for us is to see ourselves as being very creative people, innovative and entrepreneurial. Um, that applies also to our Dr. Joe, who's front, in front of us <laughs> as well, uh, being entrepreneurial and adaptive to changes in the world. So uh, we know that COVID-19 has posed many challenges. So as a university, our strategy is very simple. It's one page strategy, which helps you to think about, you know, I don't like reading many pages. So I think this helps me to remember where we want to go, just being innovative, entrepreneurial, and creative in what we do to participate in uh, the development of our country and region. We start from home here. And then to also make sure that we have the state-of-the-art infrastructure. And for us, I think when you talk about space science, the infrastructure needs to be there because, you know, for you to be able to compete both globally and, um, and internationally as well, you need that. And I know we are collaborating with UK, UK, UKZN on the, there are quite a number of collaborations on the Hyrax uh, project, which we are doing with uh, one of the engineering departments. Is it electronics? Yeah. So, and then um, there are other areas where we also want to continue that collaboration as well. So for us, um, it's important for our people. And, and that's just talking about some of the work which happens at DUNT. Uh, the group is led by Professor Innocent Davidson. And uh, this is some of the work they do in satellite communications, navigation, and surveillance uh, systems. And then um, we, we are trying to actually strengthen this area as well. These are just the other focus areas that we have at the university that are flagship. I'm just going to flash them. The green engineering area is uh, quite important for us. It was approved by Senate last year as well. And then um, there are other areas that we look at. The smart grids I mentioned already. And then we host two technology stations, by the way, which are in renewable energy one and the other one in molded plastics. Uh, which helps us also around 4IR and 3D printing as well, finding solutions and helping small, medium enterprises that may want particular solutions so they would come to DUT to work with these technology stations. And the fifth area we try to promote is, is digital technologies and which applies to space science as well. And then we have the flagship uh, program um, through um, also, which is funded by DSI through the chair. We, we call the, ch the chain Space Science, uh, but also the ICT and Society Conference, which we hold annually, and we also try to pull some resources over there. So I think with those few words really today, I just want to you know, encourage you to have, um, to have a good conference, and then I congratulate the organizers. I know it's the, space, uh, the first symposium that we have. And I hope that the next one will be even more digital so that some of us who are not able to join physically can also join from wherever we are. So congratulations, and I hope you have you know, good interactions. We want to encourage collaboration ra rather than competition uh, because I think we are so close to each other, most of the universities, that it's not worth it. Actually, if you put a satellite here, you just need one big one, uh, which uh, everybody can use to pull data from different sources. So yeah, with those few words, congratulations, and I hope you have um, you know, a successful day and a successful conference as well. Thank you so much. Uh, very impactful words. Uh, very critical is uh, translational research that impacts society in real and practical ways. Improvement on people's um, life in society, economically, you know, and improving the living standards of people, um, addressing critical problems that we have, high unemployment rates, uh, tremendous poverty, you know, and, you know, in, you know very weak uh, security systems. These are all areas that uh, our work can be much more relevant. And being able to speak in language that the lay person can understand, uh, not a language that only uh, the few here can understand, but uh, seeing that what we're doing has relevance to our society. Uh, I want to thank you, Professor Moyo, for challenging us. And um, in any area of space, science, engineering, you know, ICT and all that, uh, we have a job to do to work together, not as competitors, but as, you know, partners co cooperating to provide solutions to critical problems facing society. 
Uh, thank you very much, Prof, for that uh, uh, presentation. I just want to share very quickly uh, our activities here at DUT, and uh, I will show maybe one or two videos, depending on how the time goes. I want to try to make up for some of the uh, time we have already spent. But thank you very much for this occasion. So my presentation on, this, on the DUT Space Research Program, uh, an overview, and there were some highlights and the future plans we have. Uh, that's the outline of my presentation, uh, focus in the area of human development, uh, funding support, uh, university industry partnerships, uh, economic impact, and the future as uh, we have it laid out. Uh, the government of South Africa has indicated very clearly to the state president that we are moving towards a 100% digital economy in readiness for the industri fourth industrial revolution, you know, uh, industry 4.0. And so that is uh, the goal of the, universe, of the government to transform the economy into a digital economy. What are the implications of that? So the focus here is to address the needs of South African government and local industry. And of course, the DSI, or Department of Science and Innovation, DUT space program, is a postgraduate research program targeted at capacity building, initiative to train and develop a critical mass of requisite local expertise in various areas as outlined right there. And that's our goal. And the goal, of course, is to serve uh, various uh, small entrepreneurs, small, medium, and micro enterprises, amongst other key stakeholders. That's the, like, just like the DVC was uh, espousing. Just to give us a little backdrop, you know, in terms of uh, where we've come from. I want to look at a couple of global trends, you know, um, and look at a more holistic uh, overview. We have come through a season seeing the advent of globalization. Of course, the development of the internet and this information superhighway. We've witnessed a switch from analog to digital technologies. And of course, we've seen advanced communication technologies and the convergence of voice, data, picture, video, all happening. You've also seen in the area of uh, the power industry, we've seen protection, metering, and control all come together into one single circuitry. All this happened in the last few decades. We've also seen, going on to the fourth industrial revolution, we've seen you know, micro-militarization, advances in weaponry. If you are around and saw the uh, snapshots from the Gulf War of 1991. You remember that it was a different introduction of technology in uh, military warfare as compared to previous uh, infantry style kind of uh, combat. We've seen very advanced computerization, industrial autom automation, robotics, artificial intelligence. I'm very critical of it all is the latest now in terms of cyber physical systems and system integration. When I teach a class in the area of energy, and all that I can act I could sit down in my lecture room there and log into, you know, a house in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada, real time, and show what's happening in the house right there and any consumption data through the smart through the smart meters. These are all cyber physical systems in operation. We've also seen the advent of super learning, distance learning, e-commerce. Now these trends are not peculiar to South Africa, but they are global. And the issue is how do we benefit from these trends? And of course, if you look back in the longer history, you can see the first industrial revolution from the days of the mechanical loom, and the second industrial revolution from the days of the first conveyor belts coming to mass production, and of course, the third industrial revolution where we saw the, you know, technologies like the first programmable logic controllers, and of course, we're now into the uh, fourth industrial revolution wherein we're talking about the use of cyber physical systems in all areas, and the, dean was, the DVC was asking for a link so that we, people anywhere can actually uh, you, know, you know, capture this uh, event, and it's possible. We just want to uh, uh, go this way. So we move from coal fossil fuels to electricity generation to ICT and now cyber systems. Uh, you know, so this uh, we've also seen changing markets and new market dynamics. You know, uh, uh, however, you see that African markets are still very fragmented. You can't take a rail, uh, you know, trip from Cape Town to Cairo yet. You know, it doesn't happen. 
You know, so we still have uh, 54 more uh, countries, that, you know, and about 1.3 billion people, you know, in our continent. And we need to defragment our markets and our entire, and, and, and see that our infrastructure are more cohesive, just like you have in North America. Uh, promoting Af inter-African trade, keep on the Cairo, that kind of model good issue. And of course, the area of infrastructure development, roads, electricity, rail, high-speed ground transport, you know, airports, telecoms, and of course, the uh, information superhighway as well. Then, of course, we've seen the big advance in the area of communications and multimedia. Uh, you know, the WhatsApp now, emails, and all that, and normal things. I was doing my doctorate when the email came for the first time to UCT in 1994, 93, 94. That's when the first time I saw, I mean, email became, oh, it was with the military before then, but then became much more of a public uh, utility. So we've seen new and different goods and products, smartphones, smart meters. Advanced technologies, AI, driverless vehicles are coming, 3D printers, drones, uh, Internet of Things, our colleagues here are shooting rockets into space, you know, VSCH, you know, voltage source converter, HVDC technologies, high speed ground transport, uh, phase measurement units, PMUs, where you can you know, monitor the entire uh, state of the entire network across very large geographical areas or even the whole country. Uh, you've seen developments in the area of uh, nanotechnology. Uh, VPPs, uh, consumer technologies, big data, wireless uh, sensors. These are all key developments going on right now. And we can no longer shy away from these, but we have to become uh, at the forefront of these and use this to the improvement of our society. So our in commitment to inf rapid infrastructure development is irrevocable. And that is the call for us today to uh, respond. Now, I want to go into a bit of economics. I did this little uh, postgraduate diploma in business management, and I learned a few things from my colleagues at the business school in uh, in UKZN a few years ago. There are five essential pillars for economic success in the 21st century. Uh, the first is a highly educated and sophisticated population. We're not there yet, but we're getting there soon. We have need a highly developed technology, a rich modern and highly productive agricultural base, a rich base of energy bearing materials, and an abundant supply of non-energy bearing materials. So the first time economists globally agree that these are five critical ingredients you need for economic success in the 21st century. Very few countries have all these five, you know, together. Maybe you can talk about the US, uh, Canada, maybe Australia, but there are very few countries that are there uh, right now. So the five decades have demonstrated that every facet of human advancement is woven around a sound and stable energy and communications infrastructure. And that brings us to the whole subject about uh, uh, space science. Thank you very much. Uh, that is uh, one of our, one of our outreach uh, tools, oh, sorry. outreach tools to uh, we target this for the high school students, the young people. Uh, so part of our roadshow and so forth, encouraging students to come to university and take up careers in engineering, ICT management, you know, science, any area, you know, but the importance of developing a very highly educated society. Uh, the government has committed over 4.5 billion rand into the space infrastructure hub. Well, that's news already, so I don't want to go into much of that right now. And of course, um, our area of focus in DUT is on satellite communication, navigation, and uh, surveillance, and of course, the broader area of space uh, science research. Uh, so far, this last uh, is it two, three years, we've received a total of about six million rand from uh, the DSI. We've had other grants from the university and a few other 
agencies, but a key sponsor here is uh, the DSI. And I want to acknowledge that the DSI, uh, Sansa, ATNS, uh, they send their apologies for not being here in person because there's a major uh, international African summit happening right now at the same time, you know, which they all had to go to as uh, government mandate. So they send their apologies, Mr. Mudal, Mr. Kaiser Morocco, uh, send their, you know, re, you know their, their apologies. So in this program, we're funding uh, nine master students and six doctoral students. There are several other students who are not, uh, you know, who are also part of the program who may not be naturally be funded by the government. Uh, you know, we have students from, uh, you know, uh, Montenegro, for example. We have students from France, you know, and. Uh, and supervisors also locally and a few others internationally and from Brazil as well and France. Uh, we, you know, so more of that when the presentations all start. So we are still building up an infrastructure right here and um, some of these students will present in the course of this program. We've had uh, four of our master's students graduate and one PhD student completing his studies right now. And um, we have projects that are industry-based projects. We have uh, supervisors from the university and industrial mentors from industry, you know, working together to uh, bring about that type of development. That's the kind of synergy we put together in most of these uh, projects. There are a couple of highlights in terms of our research activities and some you know, key areas where students can be drawn from, you know, both from engineering, non-engineering, science, uh, management, and so forth. Uh, we also see the applications of these in areas of defense, science, technology, education, communications, and of course, transportation and, and navigation. These are some of the other scope of activities that we're looking at in terms of various, uh, uh, you know, global uh, network of, uh, you know, satellite systems that uh, can be used for different applications uh, across, you know, the nation and the international. Let me look at a few quick applications and then I want to wrap this up very quickly because I know our time is a bit strained. Um, we, uh, applications, for example, in the area of agriculture. So we can apply some of these are global navigation systems, you know, you know, um, in the area of uh, agriculture. And here we can look at areas like, uh, well, the prediction is that by 2050, our world population may be about 10 billion people. So we need to have more investments in the area of precision agriculture. And uh, GNSS and our entire space uh, you know, the uh, research program has a big role to play in the area of uh, improving on our productivity in terms of agricultural produce. And uh, we're looking at things like automation, machine learning, computer vision, AI, uh, all areas helping to improve agriculture. And that area here, for example, is mechanized farming, which is a, a precursor to pre you know, precision farming. Uh, these are applications for farmers as well. So we, we must move beyond the hoe and the cutlass to more sophisticated technologies for us to have increased productivity. We need to also have machine-to-machine you know, -machine communications so that these different devices can all operate simultaneously without any uh, you know, collisions and all kinds of uh, interruptions because they all are synchronized and they all can communicate with each other using technology. Then, of course, other areas of application you can see here also is in the area of uh, you know, uh, microgrids and various uh, power grids and so forth to see that uh, both in terms of car navigation systems, smartphones, these are all coordinated. And one key area there is the aspect of time synchronization must be accurate to the very last. Other applications include developing tools, mapping water bodies, locating irrigation systems, and I defined various, you know, suitable location for cultivation, that's in the area of agriculture, uh, reducing labor, working in all conditions, both day, night, winter, cold, or whatever you can, because most of these things are remotely controlled, so you don't have to have a problem about visibility, just with the farmer on the on his tracks. Then, of course, accurate planting, weeding, harvesting, and all that. Now, um, there's a video here I wanted to show, but I think I'm going to skip it because uh, it is a bit uh, very thought-provocative. Too, pro too, too provocative. Uh, let me wrap this up because of the time. You know, you have access to this information. so. Uh, the, the, the discussion there was just talking about the future of, uh, of uh, what are the predictions about the future of technology we are going to with this new, in, in this new era. So I just want to skip that because uh, we started a bit of a time. So new students and recruitment is beginning for 2022. Uh, community outreach is going out there. I want to welcome anyone here and 
to your friends, family, and all those that uh, they're welcome to be a part of this uh, future that we are putting together here at DUT and, of course, with all our partner universities. We are aligned to the Sustainable Development Goals as outlined there very carefully, you know, and, um, you know, space science assets and technologies can be used to support most of the United Nations Sustainability uh, Sustainable Development Goals, as we've spelled out there, and we're also aligned to the Envision 2030 uh, vision for this university, uh, across all universities as well, and um, uh, we cover areas, uh, we emphasize areas like creativity, innovative curricula, and research, state of the art infrastructure, a distinctive education, an engaged community or university, green ecosystems, as well as adaptable graduates. You know, these are strategic objectives of the Envision 2030. So I'm the uh, team leader, I'm you know, the very uh, robust team of co supervisors, SPAT supervisors, co supervisors, as I've mentioned right here, partners we learn from in other universities and vice versa, postgraduate researchers are right here. Uh, industry, and of course, uh, I want to thank my team that helped us to put this all together. I think I should stop there for now, and uh, let's carry on with the proceedings. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. Okay, in case if you have any question for Professor Davidson, you can just signify by the raise of hand. In the absence of question, uh, we move to the next presentation. The next presenter is uh, Ms. Uh, Nompu Melelo, Chile. She will be presenting a uh, presentation titled the, the Performance Analysis of Precoding Schemes for Massive Multiple Input, Multiple Output System. Ms. Chile, you can step forward for your presentation. Please, let's give her a round of applause. You have 15 minutes for your presentation. 15 minutes. Still the morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, Okay, um, my topic for um, my thesis is performance analysis uh, of pre-coding schemes for massive MIMO. Uh, I'm John Pumelelo Tili, and um, down there I'm a supervisor and a co-supervisor. Um, this is the content, the content um, the list of the things that I'm going to, to discuss or talk about. Um, introduction. Uh, multiple input, multiple output, which is a uh, memo in short, um, is basically um, a, 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 an antenna technology um, for wireless communication. Uh, in which um, multiple antennas um, are used at um, the, the transmitter and, and the receiver. And the uses are um, in 4G, uh, LTE, 5G, and beyond. Uh, so my, uh, MIMO has played an integral role in transforming um, terrestrial wi uh, wireless networks. And um, basically, um, my, my research is more on massive MIMO. So massive MIMO, it's um, the system that scales up MIMO technology by order of hundreds of antennas to supply tens of users or user terminals uh, at the same time frequency um, resources. And, um, but massive MIMO is suffering from pilot contamination but then to deal with pilot contamination, there is a pre-coding, which is, um, it's mostly down, at, um, it's effective if it is done at uh, the transmitter side. Um, 
of the system and um, pre-coding design for massive for, for MIMO technology has gained uh, attraction from researchers and it has established in wireless uh, in various wireless standards. Uh, the problem statement is, um, as I've said, that massive MIMO is here to change the terrestrial um, part of a segment. So, but it suffers from pilot contamination leading to uh, channel estimation errors. So, um, the transmitted signal is bound to be impaired um, by the known and unknown interferences. And uh, intra and inter intra and intercell interferences are common ch channel uh, impairments. So um, um, among performance aspects design regarding massive MIMO, uh, pre-coding is one of the most important function component to mitigate um, the interference in a channel. Then pre-coding at the base station, which is the transmitter side, is essential. <laughs> Um, to ensure reliable down, down, downlink transmission. And um, various pre-coding schemes uh, will be studied and uh, uh, two from uh, linear pre-codings and two from non-linear pre-codings will be selected um, to, 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 to complete the research. And the research question is, um, that I have to answer at the end of uh, my master's is, can channel estimation in combination with various pre-codings uh, um, be effectively employed to mitigate pilot contamination? And my objectives are, the first one is to compare and analyze pre-coding schemes. And then when, when that is done, uh, two of from each, from linear and non-linear will be chosen and then it will be uh, analyzed using spectrum efficiency and the BR. And then the second objective is um, to model perfect and imperfect uh, channel state information using Rayleigh uh, fading model at time division duplex. And the third objective is to, um, I'll, I'll combine the second objective with the first objective uh, with the aim of analyzing the performance of the system. Um, Okay, literature. Um, so the increasing demand for comprehensive broadband and wireless uh, communication services and accessibility has brought about um, the increased development for satellite work or for satellite network that strongly supports terrestrial backhaul networks, providing inherent material cost, broadcast and interrupted radio. Uh, radio coverage to stationary, portable, and uh, moving receivers. Uh, so um, wireless technology, uh, which is uh, also uh, falls under the fifth generation, is one of the emerging technology in the first industrial revolution, including robotic, artificial, internet of things. Uh, there's also machine-to-machine -machine connectivity, there is, there is a lot that um, can support wireless uh, communities. Um, 5G is uh, a wireless network architect that builds on various triple E wireless network standards. Um, so it aims to increase uh, data rates, reduce la uh, latency, which is the delay between the receiver and um, the between the transmitter and the, the receiver, uh, also enhance uh, energy saving, cost reduction, uh, and also promote uh, massive device connectivity. Um, multi MIMO technology can transform terrestrial wireless, um, and it's also one of the foundation technologies that makes up 5G. Uh, Massive MIMO has played an integral role in transforming terrestrial wireless communication leading to the growth acknowledgement and researches. Uh, pilot contamination okay um, when uh, uh, two user terminals 
or pilot sequences, also known as uh, reference signals leading to inter-user interference uh, in channel estimation. And um, as I've said, amongst various uh, performance aspects, uh, pre-coding is um, one of the essential parts that will help to reduce pilot contamination. Uh, pre-coding algorithms are used to address system performance. Uh, the use achieve some rate data traffic, improve spectrum spectral efficiency, improve bit error rate, um, data throughput, quality of service, and um, transmission reliability. With a reliable CSI, which is channel state information, pre-coding can be used to maximize link performance and achieve the way some capacity. Pre-coding techniques uh, varies according to performance criteria and type of channel state information at the transmitter. Excuse me. Pre-coding algorithms can be brought in, uh, can be branched into linear and non-linear. As I've said that um, I'll be uh, studying a list of linear pre-codings and list of, uh, sorry, lin list of linear pre-codings and list of uh, non-linear pre-codings. Then two from each will be um, selected and then uh, be used to, to, to complete my study. So here are some of um, the linear pre-codings which include uh, zero forcing, minimum min square, uh, Chorsky, Sherman, Morrison, Precoder, and um, there is a maximum ratio combining, and uh, some of um, nonlinear techniques uh, that include the dirty paper precoding, Tomlin, Tomlin, Sin, Harishma precoding, vector perturbation, and uh, they are blind and semi blind uh, precoders, uh, just to mention a few. So from this list, um, I'll select two from each to work with. Um, Lots of literature for the precoding algorithm dealing with uh, the system analysis and the theory has been uh, surveyed. Which, uh, zero forcing precoding use, uh, uses spatial signal processing to nullify the multi user interference signal in wireless communication. Literature reveals that zero forcing has been proven to perform better in higher spectral efficiency and um, low energy efficiency, and it works better in high signal noise to ratio region. Zero forcing achieves a logical performance with much less complexity. Uh, so zero forcing falls under linear precordings. Um, Non-linear precordings are more complex. <coughs> the performance of a precording scheme for massive MIMO will be analyzed and simulated using MATLAB. Uh, this is um, the methodology that I'm, I'm going to follow. Um, so basically, theoretical and simulation will be performed to carry out um, this work. Precoding schemes uh, will be studied, and then um, performance and uh, per, um, the, and then mo will model, I will model perfect and imperfect channel state information and then combine um, the pre-coding schemes and then the, um, the model to, 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 to carry out the, uh, the, the, the to, sum up, to, 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 to carry out the work that I'm supposed to do. Uh, proposed setup or simulation. Uh, first, uh, the linear and non-linear pre-coding schemes will be simulated using MATLAB. Uh, and uh, the model CSI will be implemented in uh, combination with the selected pre-coding schemes. Um, at the moment, um, I, I, um, I, I am analyzing the pre-coding pre schemes, and then when um, the after analyzing them, then I'll be comparing them, comparing the linear and the non-linear. Uh, then um, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to write a paper from it. So um, uh, so these are the primary result, preliminary results. Um, these one are from the linear uh, part of precodings um, that I, I have um, looked at. Um, 
uh, uh, preliminary results have been uh, obtained for linear precorders, which is, uh, I use truncated polynomial expansion, which is uh, TPE in short, uh, the minimum mean square error, the Chosky, Sherman Morrison, uh, and uh, the performance in terms of uh, signal to noise ratio, BR, and uh, varying CSI error were analyzed and pretend, presented as below. Uh, and the assumption that we made was um, all the, we, we use uh, six, we, 16 users or user terminals in one cell. And then um, in that cell, there were 110, or there are 128 antennas. Um, the result uh, is what I've obtained. Uh, but uh, these, these are still linear precoding. I still need to um, do more for non-linear precoding, then compare both, and then later come up with the paper. So um, this is what I've done. Um, so this figure is where um, user terminal, um, which is the users or our cell phones, um, at the rate versus signal to noise ratio, for varying channel state information errors. Um, these are also the results that I got. And um, discussion in figure one. Uh, figure one compares the average bit error amongst, among uh, minimum mean square error precoding. Um, Chosky, Shema Morrison precoder and the truncated polynomial expansion precoder. Uh, based on the figure, a number of um, observations can be made. Uh, minimum mean square error precoding, as well as uh, CSM precoding, has comparable performance and um, outperformed the TPE precoder. Um, when the value of the power of the polynomial J for TPE precoder is increased, meaning and in complexity. It, uh, the bit error rates proves, improve and come close to, but still less than the RNA precoder. But this comes at the cost of increasing hardware um, resources. Uh, uh, figure two, we also compare minimum, minimum mean square error precoding, CSM precoding, TPE in, in, in presence of uh, three different level of channel uh, knowledge. Figure three demonstrates BR performance comparison in fading channel. It can be seen that uh, when uh, J is increased, BR performance of uh, TPE precoding has uh, improved in some extent. Yet BR um, of MMSE precoder and, SM and CSM precoder are still superior to that of uh, TPE precoder, notwithstanding when J is equal to four. And um, near the, MM the MMSE and CSM precoder also, as the signal to interference noise ratio increases, the performance of all precoder improve faster. Uh, this exploits the massive MIMO diversity and improve the channel performance, hence uh, reduced BR. In conclusion, the paper um, that I'll be write, like that I will write, will give uh, the performance analysis and uh, the comparison of um, the uh, minimum mean square error precoder, CSM precoder and uh, the TPE precoder within a single cell for a downlink massive MIMO system. The performance for three precoder schemes in terms of uh, signal to noise, signal to interference noise ratio, BR, and data rates for both perfect and imperfect CSI are studied. And these were derived theoretically for each of the precoding schemes under similar assumptions and uh, for wireless a uh, massive MIMO system. For simulation and theoretical results, MMSE, precoder, CSM, precoder, and high data rate, and the low BR, then um, the TPE precoder.
um, these are references, some of the references that I looked into, and I uh, thank you. It basically, it's the, the technology that is done, uh, mostly at the, 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 I would say the base station. It's more computational. It's, um, it's those, uh, I would say, systems that um, happen before you place a call or before you send a message. So, um, yeah. Okay, um, as I've said in my research, um, 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 most, most research is done on linear precoding scheme. So what I want to do is I want to do the, the linear precoding and the non-linear precoding. So for linear precoding, um, I'm going to use a minimum mean square error, uh, truncated, uh, So, sorry. So for, um, um, for linear precoding, I'm using um, the TPE, the MMSE, and the CMS precoding. And then I'm still going to go through the um, non-linear precodings, and then I'm going to select two from there, and then um, I'll use them to, to, to complete my, my study. Okay, um, okay, um, basically, um, MIMO, okay, MIMO, MIMO is one of, um, I'll say one of, um, the fourth industrial revolution uh, component. It is, um, one of those components that are going to, to make sure that we reach the speed that we want uh, during communication. It's, um, it's going to make sure that uh, there are no uh, call dropping when you're making a call. It, it, it's going to make sure that um, our um, Teams meetings, the Zoom, is, is not delayed. It, it, it's, it's in the real time proceeding. So um, basically, um, that that that's what MIMO system is, but then when um my my focus is um at I wanna focus at what happens to make sure that uh, the connectivity is at the real time, to make sure that we don't drop out calls, to make sure that we don't lose communication um connectivity. So um, thank you. We are with talking for the presenter, uh, Ms. Numusa. You can step. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you so much. The next presentation is by uh, Mr. Radoj Zinkik um, on apparatus for tracking containers in land and sea transportation, and it will be presented by Professor Sanjay Box from DUT. Prof, you can step forward. Please round of applause. Good day, colleagues, once again. Thank you very much for coming, for your time. I will present this uh, work on behalf of my doctoral student, Rade Jankic. He is currently in Montenegro, and unfortunately, he couldn't be uh, able to join us. 
Um, he is enrolled as PhD student last year at the Faculty of um, Informatics and Accounting at the Department of Information System. And um, uh, on the opposite of the previous presentation, which was dealing with uh, simulation of channel at physical at communication level, our application is, let's say, more oriented towards applications. So it's, it's another level, but uh, I think we can cope <laughs> with each other different topics. Most probably, majority of uh, you knows that 80 percentage of uh, uh, transportation of goods by volume is uh, done by uh, maritime transportation overseas, and 60 uh, percentage of all goods due to the value are transported again uh, via maritime transportation or overseas because. This kind of transportation is uh, still the cheapest and the most massive form of transporting good uh, around the globe. But what I would like to say, uh, there is, um, how to say, a lagging of this industry in terms of digitalization in comparison to other industries. And this is proof to um, numerous uh, uh, literature resources that I have passed through. What are the reasons? Maritime industry is uh, conservative, and there is a lot of rejection of old captains and seamen to accept new technology because they don't believe in it too much. So younger generations of seafarers and those who are employed in maritime industry are more interested in digitalization. And also the key players in maritime are forcing us to adopt these technology in maritime as well. And unfortunately, this is the future of, of maritime navigation. It will be digitalized. In this slide, you can see the biggest container ship uh, in, in this year. It belongs to Hyundai Merchant Marine. It is international company. It uh, carries 24,020 equivalent units or containers. Um, each of these containers has about 24 tons. So it's a huge amount of goods. Um, 576,000 tons is carrying by this ship. What is the problem here from perspective of digitalization? Still, it is not possible to track each and every container uh, individually while the ship is at sea. Why this is the case? Because internet at sea is not so reliable um, and accurate and always accessible as internet at land. So offshore internet and internet at sea is not stable uh, as it is uh, on the land side. So huge uh, investments in terms of uh, establishing communication and its keeping should be done. And this communication between land and ship should not be based only on internet. So under the maritime cloud, uh, uh, several channels are developing to overcome the problem of internet connection at sea. And later I will mention some of that channels that are developing in, in parallel under the common maritime communication platform or maritime cloud to overcome the problems with internet connection at sea. Um, recently, we have a blockchain uh, technology development in the form of trade lands. Um, it's a special uh, blockchain technology developed by IBM and applied by Danish Marx company. And they work closely together. But what they can do, they can um, manage transport plan in close to real time. They can track and update bill of lading and cargo manifest at any moment of time, but still they physically cannot follow each and every container. When I was talking to some experts in the field, they immediately told me there is no need to track and trace every single container. To be honest, I don't agree, especially if we are transporting, for instance, dangerous cargo or if we are transporting some cargo that has to be controlled for these and that reason, um, uh, perishable cargo, for instance, and so on. 
So if we assume that we are uh, transporting radioactive waste or radioactive materials via sea, in that case, it would be so important to track and trace every single container which is filled with radioactive materials. And I think you agree. The company who is doing this successfully at world scale is Pacific Nuclear Transport Limited Company. It is operating since 1975. And up to now, they didn't have no accidents. But who claimed that accidents couldn't happen in the future? So we should be ready. They are checking and tracing each and every container with radioactive materials on board the ship and sending reports to uh, the Barlow station in UK, which is controlling this transportation. But still, there is no direct link between each and every single container with radioactive materials and that station in UK. These uh, PMTL ships have double hull construction, dual navigation, monitoring, and uh, calling systems, twin engines, rudders and propellers, backup power generators, radioactivity monitoring, secured cargo, enhanced buoyancy, bow thrusters, backup generators, additional firefighting equipment, and weather routing system. So they are quite well equipped. But, as I said, um, there is no possibility to track every single cask or drum with radioactive materials from a land site. What is the advantage of these type of ships? They can carry only 20 containers with radioactive materials. So for the starting experiments of following each and every container, it should be good to use these type of ships because they have a small amount of containers and it would be easier to track and daze them simultaneously um, in real time. All PMTL ships have satellite navigation and weather routing equipment, as well as tracking equipment. Such systems enable these ships to follow the safest route and avoid severe weather patterns. Ship's position is monitored at any stage of her voyage. The voyage monitoring system automatically reports the vessel's latitude and longitude, speed and heading every two hours. If a message is not received, by the report center within a predetermined time, PNTL's emergency response system is automatically activated. If a ship accounts difficulty, trained and fully equipped PNTL emergency team in 24 hours is on stand and uh, they will come to assist. Uh, here we proposed a model for tracking and, and tracing uh, these containers on board such a ships. We have assumed that each ship's cargo hold is treated as a remote area modular monitoring subsystem connected with central monitoring system on board, referring to Argus project um, attainments or achievements. This is a project which is realized in uh, Ilionos in USA, uh, starting from 2008. They were very active until 2011, and they were tracking and tracing containers with radioactive materials in uh, road and rail transportation, but not at sea. A digital video camera or optical sensor might be incorporated into each of these remote area modular monitoring um, areas. Uh, the RFID active tags attached to each radioactive material drums bolt contains following sensors, sensors for temperature, 3-axis digital uh, accelerometer, a gamma sensor, neutron sensor, electronic loop seal, and uh, rechargeable lithium-ion battery. All these sensors are connected with monitoring system via two-layer network, via wired Ethernet and wireless network for security purposes. The connection between the ship and the uh, coastal station can go via Inmarsat C, Iridium, or uh, VHF data exchange system, which is a new system developed to, um, how to, to say, to uh, overlap the problems with internet at sea. And this system uh, uses um, application-specific message six which refers to dangerous cargo information plus following communication to the land-based uh, control report center. So our idea here is to propose 
channels through which communication between every single container and control center in Barlow in UK can be established. We published several papers upon this uh, model and our trials to conduct it into uh, practice or to open debate in academic um, uh, cycles about the issue. And we have some suggestions that we should develop a project and, and so on and so forth, but you know that is always connecting with the uh, finances and so on, and it is not so easy to compete with industry, which is more powerful than academia in terms of research at the current moment. So my PhD student decided to, to start from a scratch, so he made this very simple instrument for tracking and tracing containers, and uh, he will do experiments firstly on land and the rail transportation, and afterwards he will upload um, a container with this instrument uh, on board the ship, and he will follow the ship in a coastal navigation firstly, and then we shall see what uh, we uh, will achieve. This is the basic uh, scheme of his instrument. In the very center is this Raspberry Pi computer. It has uh, UPS, uh, which um, has to prevent and working voltage oscillations, and also it has a battery of 2,600 milliampere uh, hour, and it operates uh, 24 hours. Then this Raspberry Pi is connected with sensors for motion, temperature, humidity, and light. We will not do with radioactive cargo at the first uh, step. Uh, my student is using Python for acquisition of the data from the sensors and also for triggering alarms in the case of need. So I hope for the next conference which Professor Davison is organizing in January, we shall have pseudo code <laughs> in Python to show you that we really work on this. And the uh, Raspberry Pi is connected with GSM and GPS uh, modem. It is connected with a server with a web-based security application, which is connected with desktop working station or with mobile device, with a smartphone, and so on, so that you can um, follow up uh, where is your container and in which state it is. Um, and as I said, first we will do experiments in land and road transportation, and then we will do in, uh, in, in a short coastal navigation, and we shall see how it will go further. But of course, um, it is easy when you have one com uh, container, when you have 24,000 containers, which are in 13 layers, uh, six layers uh, under the deck and seven layers above the deck, <laughs> it might be a big problem. So um, we know this is a very basic step, but at least it's something, and it is a physical experiment, and it's done from scratch. Student is doing from his own modest resources, and I think it's, it's uh, worth of our attention. Thank you very much for your time and listening, and if you have questions, please proceed. Yeah, uh, the, the guys who are smarter than me, they propose two additional channels besides the internet. They propose these uh, VHF uh, data exchange system. This is one system. And uh, the other is navigational data system. It is um, extension of NAFTEX, which was previously used. So today at sea, they have three channels which are active. So if internet is not working, you can use these VDES or you can use NAV data. So there are three actual systems um, which can be used. But the problem is that a huge number of ships that are operating around the globe are not um, in compliance with SOLAS convention. So they are non-SOLAS ships. So they do not complain with the standards, comply with the standards for communication. So what I see, um, uh, ships are going to, to the rubbish after 25 years. 
So within the future 30 years, all the ships will be new. And now you have requirements if you build a new ship. It has to comply with all these requirements in terms of communication. So I see huge changes within the next uh, 30 years, and I do believe that ships will be with a few members of crew, crew or no crew at all. So they will be um, self-driving uh, ships. So that's, that's how I foresee in the future of, of navigation. And what we are teaching students, I have to say here, it's, it's a quite obsolete. <laughs> they have to be prepared with the new digital time in maritime which is coming. So they should be skilled in these digital communication technologies and so on. Uh, and uh, a lot of things in navigation which what we are teaching them nowadays will go to the museum very soon. Uh, but you know, our programs are very rigid and it is very difficult to change them in accordance to the requirements of actual moment. Thank you, Prof, very much for your question. That's a very good question. Thank you very much. Yes, before we start the next presentation, we're supposed to do a gift uh, presentation to the supervisor of the student that presented the other time, but uh, I think she's not here. So we move to the next presentation by Mr. Philip Guasi Hagui. Uh, he will be presenting on the overview of UKZN Aerospace System Research Group's Phoenix Hybrid Rocket Program. Mr. Philip, you can step forward for your presentation. Please come to the side. You have 15 minutes for your presentation. Okay, you, we'll give you oh, 30 minutes for your presentation. <laughs> I don't think I'll use all that time. Morning, everybody. My name is Philip Jesse Ajay, and I'm the project engineer on the Phoenix program. I'm also a PhD student registered in the mechanical engineering department. And today I'm gonna to give you a short overview of our Phoenix hybrid rocket program. So I'll give you an introduction to the program first of all, then we'll talk about some technical aspects of hybrid rocket propulsion. I'll introduce you to our Phoenix fleet of rockets. We'll look at Overberg testing range, which is where we launch our rockets. I'll take you through our previous two launch campaigns. We'll look at our future and yeah, I'll we'll take some questions after that. So the Phoenix program falls under UKZN's Aerospace Systems Research Group. And we consist of a mix of PhD and master's students uh, supervised by four full-time um, UKZN staff members and our objective is to develop low-cost hybrid sounding rockets, or sounding rockets in general. And this is to service technological demonstrations, but also to build human skills capital. And we have quite an extensive heritage. We've launched four different rockets, done a bunch of lab-scale hot-fire static tests, and three full-scale hot-fire tests. That's with the rocket on the gantry, blowing out the whole motor. And as I said, four four rocket launches. So in ASREG, we believe the team is everything. In Zulu, they say, umuntu, kumuntu, gabantu. And we really strive towards this because this is how you improve the country. You make a bunch of smart kids and you send them out into industry. So that's our, I would say, our chief goal, human capital development. So what are sounding rockets? There are these small, unguided rockets which carry experimental payloads to the upper atmosphere. They are classed as suborbital vehicles because we don't reach orbit and the booster stage and the payload return to Earth. And it's a very good platform for a research group such as us to get experience in aerospace technology and develop those kinds of skills. So what are hybrid rockets? Well, in rocketry, we have three different kinds of chemical rockets. First is liquid rockets, where your oxidizer and fuel are kept in the liquid stage and propellant tanks. The second one, known as solid rockets, you mix your oxidizer and your fuel in a grain and you cast that. And what we do is a mix of the two hybrid. We have our fuel in the solid state and a liquid oxidizer in a tank. The chief advantage is it's super safe because the propellants are in different states and very easy to be kept separate. And yeah, the penalty we pay is reduced performance compared to 
solids and liquids. But again, this is excellent for getting your hands dirty in aerospace technology. So to date, we've developed four different Phoenix vehicles. The 1A was well, our first endeavor, was a more of a technical demonstration to see if hybrid rocket propulsion is something that's feasible. And after that, we went with the 1Bs. The Mark I was a recoverable vehicle. It carries a payload as well, parachute system, and that was made out of an aluminum tank. After that, we switched over to composites with the Mark II and the Mark IIr. These are what we term as racehorses. They're the Ferraris. They go super high. The Mark I is a workhorse, carries payloads, so Ford Ranger, Ferrari. Uh, this is the general structure of a Mark I rocket. You can see in the middle there's a giant propellant tank that makes up most of the volumetric mass of the rocket. We keep our telemetry system and payload up there in the rocket, I mean, sorry, in the nose cone, which is made out of glass fiber with an aluminum tip, sometimes stainless steel, just to absorb some of the aerodynamic heating. And also it's easy to machine a point on metal than it is with a composite. And yeah, basic structure. At the bottom there, you can see a bunch of valves. We use that to fill the tank and it also serves as the main oxidizer valve, which introduces the oxidizer into the, the hybrid motor, the solid motor. So Overberg testing range, which is where we launch our rockets, it's a Denel run test range located in the De Hoop Nature Reserve, close to the southernmost tip of Africa, which is Cape Agulhas. And they have a bunch of expertise. They've been doing this for a while. They have various radar tracking and other tracking instrumentation. They have a dedicated control room to monitor the tests and they host the iconic Building 11, which is where the original RSA um, launch program, that's where they integrated the satellite payload with the rocket. So let's look at our previous campaigns. In 2019, we attempted to launch a Mark I with the goal of smashing the African record. And this is a short video to show you how that went. Yeah, so it didn't go too well. Uh, shortly after launch, oops, the main oxidizer valve cut off and rocket came tumbling down to earth and flew all across the field. But we learned our lessons, picked up the pieces, and if you noticed in the video, everything went up in a white cloud of smoke. This highlights the safety of hybrids. If there was a liquid or solid, phew, huge explosion, all your equipment melted. So we learned our lessons. The biggest one was that you shouldn't get mechanical engineers to do the electronics of such systems. <laughs> and yeah, so there's the valve that cut off. We suspect the high gravitational loading during takeoff just shut off the Arduino. Lesson number two, don't use Arduinos for rocket launches. And it cutting off then led to the valve closing which was an error because of a few lines of code. Instead of saying, no communication, stay open, was no communication closed. So we tried again in 2022, this time more ambitious. We took two rockets, the Mark I and the Mark IIr revived, and we hoped to recover the Mark I with a landwards launch, and the Mark II would go over sea this is how that went. So yeah, the second time it worked. And this is some performance specs of the two rockets we launched. The Mark I R is noticeably longer and bigger because it stores much more propellant as it's aiming for a higher altitude. Also, there's a difference in the fuel we used with the Mark I, it's just solid paraffin wax, which is actually what we use our, as our fuel is candle wax. 
and we cast the grains ourselves at UKZN. The second one was a mix of candle wax and 20% aluminum powder, just to give us a bit of a performance boost. We aimed for five kilometers and 15 kilometers for both. And yeah, we massively exceeded our expectations. We smashed the record with the one reaching almost 18 kilometers and the other hit 11 kilometers. And our Mark II actually hit twice the speed of sound. So yeah, we failed to recover the Mark I's nozzle, uh, nose cone, which held the payload because our parachute, one of the cords snapped, it ripped, all these things we didn't account for. But, you know, God is funny and the booster washed up on the beach a few weeks later and we've got that back at the lab. Yeah, and at the top there are shots that we got from the onboard camera. The last one, we could see the darkness of space. So in future, we plan on launching two more rockets at the end of next year. A Mark 1C, a racehorse, Mark 1D workhorse, similar, similar setup as our previous launch. But now we're slimming down the tanks even further with our racehorse. We're reducing more layers of carbon fiber in our tank and we're removing the PVC liner which we previously used. Hopefully we can squeeze 30 kilometers this time. And with the 1C, which is the racehorse, we're considering having a chaff dispenser as a payload. You can use this to track the motion of wind in the upper atmosphere, if you can actually track the individual particles. And with the 1D, we're thinking of having CubeSat-sized you know, brackets or mountings. And one of the payloads will go to Sansa. Another one will be part of a high school challenge just develop something that fits in there. And the third one, we're looking at collaborating with a university to develop something there. And yeah, a word to our sponsors, especially Department of Science and Innovation, who we couldn't do any of this without. They've shown tremendous support for this new space era that we're going into. Yeah, thank you, any questions? Please feel free. Well, in addition to the cameras, we have uh, pressure sensors because we use this to gauge how high we are in the alt in the atmosphere to deploy our payload recovery systems. But yeah, apart from that nothing else. We're open to suggestions. We're also thinking of having external antennas to help boost our downlink speeds and clarity. So maybe you guys can come up with something there. Hey, I'd like to ask, do you have any uh, SANDF applications here? Is, is this classified as a military? SANDF is in the part of the military, you know. Yeah, I'm sure about that. Yeah, very much so. Yeah, we do have a telemetry system, and where we launched OTR also have tracking capabilities in terms of visually tracking the, the vehicle. But yeah, we do have telemetry systems. Is it, I mean, how proficient is it to launch rockets from continuing to South Africa is located in the southern hemisphere? Is it efficient to launch? 
Well, I suppose it depends what you're trying to achieve because here in South Africa, firstly, around Overberg test range, you have low flight traffic, so you don't have to worry about hitting any civilians. Okay. And it's very close if you're trying to achieve a polar orbit. Okay. But yeah, I suppose with an equatorial orbit, you would consider moving up to the equator. But I mean, you can achieve that here. Maybe you'll need a bit more fuel, but... Yeah, you can do it. Thanks. For you? Okay. Before we go ahead with the next presentation, we have gift presentation for the supervisors. Uh, our first call on Professor Bock for our gifts. Professor Bok. Thank you. Oh, we also have uh, a gift for Professor Jim Peter. A round of applause. <laughs> As a supervisor. <laughs> The next presentation is by Mr. Nkosi Gumede from DUT, uh, presenting the uh, presentation tied to the performance of low density uh, parity check codes for satellite communication in KA band. Mr. Nkosi, please step forward. morning, everyone. Um, okay, I'm here uh, to present uh, the performance um, of um, DPC codes uh, for satellite uh, communication in uh, KA band. Um, my name is uh, Bonkos Kumete, uh, my supervisor is Dr. Mulango, and I now have an only co-supervisor, which is Dr. Uh, Mokupua. Yeah, so 
let's get into it. Okay, here's uh, the table um, of the contents. Um, and then uh, my abstracts. So, you know, this research, okay, so uh, this research you know, present uh, the performance um, of uh, low density apparatchik uh, codes in a KF band associated uh, communication. So, <clears throat> the major problem we have is that, you know, the rain um, attenuation, you know, is a problem, okay, in the KF band. So, it causes the major uh, signal uh, degradation. So, so we are trying to use the um, ADPC code, you know, to cater, you know, for that problem. So basically, in order uh, to mitigate it, and then we, okay, I have already done, you know, my research, and I have, uh, uh, you know, my research as well. So which, you know, I'm going to show you, you know, as we go along this one. In fact, it, you know, it is, uh, uh, you know, the Dutch chaps on this. Uh, on this uh, presentation. So what I have done for now, you know, I've simulated this, you know, right, at tips codes, but only with, um, uh, only with um, addictive white, um, white uh, gas and noise. And then my next step, it should be uh, to add the KA band uh, multi, um, multi, um, multiplicative. Uh, not vector, so I'm doing it, you know, step by step. Then, but now, you know, my next step is to add, you know, that um, multiplicative uh, not vector. So, so far, you know, the results um, they are good. So we are headed, you know, in the right direction. Okay. Um, problem uh, st statement is that uh, <coughs> you know the low a frequency band, you know, now, you know, they are actually uh, used up, so they, um, so we have to move now, you know, to the cave band and, you know, all those higher bands as well, but, but frequency bands such as the uh, cave band are susceptible uh, to weather impairments. Now, because you are at a very high frequency, so, you know, uh, the wavelength, you know, it's quite short, so, now imagine you're having, you know, this short wave land. So, you know, um, if it rains, if it rains, then, you, you know, the rain drop, you know, it's going to affect it. So then you will need to use very um, effective recording scheme, like the um, low density pressure codes, which are really good, you know, in terms of the performance. Now, this research, right, has been done before. But what, you know, they didn't do, they never added the adaptive uh, modulation. So what we are doing different here, right, at DUT, we are doing the same thing, but then we're adding the adaptive modulation. So we expect to get you know, the best results as of this. Um, now, I continue that. So, so as I said, that those guys here, Sheng, Fujing, Dashing, and you know, you know, all of them, and other guys as well. So, you know, they've done this, but um, you know, they're proving this, but then they did not add the adaptive modulation. So I'm seeing, you know, the problem there, so I want to improve that. So how it's going to work then when you're adding it is that we're going to be switching between the 16 QAM to, to the 32 QAM, and then we go high to the 64 QAM. Now that would depend if uh, there's rain, then we know that, you know, if there's rain, then we're going to be having a, a very uh, low um, um, SNR. Then, in that case, we go down to the 16 QAM. But as soon as we get, you know, the best signal, so meaning that, you know, if uh, the rain, you know, is low, then we go high up, you know, to 64 QAM, so that, you know, we can transmit, I mean, a more data. So that we have a suggested more data. So, but you know, you know, that would depend on the amount you know, of the signal to noise ratio. If it's low, then we go, you know, to um, you know, to the low uh, 16 qm. I mean, 16 qm, and then you know, um, if it's good, then you know, we go high up. Yeah. So we just you know, system, we do that you know by itself. 
So that would be the code that you know we are implementing, which would send the signature notes rate and then and then give and then give the feedback via uh, the return channel. Okay, um, now let me show you the um, uh, uh, the system model. So, th so we're getting the data and then we um, encoding it. You know, uh, we modulate, and then we do you know the app convection. You know, now the channel. So, like I said, now what we've done now at the moment, you know, the simulation, we've simulated. You know, only okay, okay, let me just walk here. Only uh, this part here, but we haven't done this, you know, this, this, you know, this part yet. So, which is, you know, the main problem, you know, is that we know how the random noise that we get, you know, um, you know, specifically uh, for the data. So, we haven't done it yet. So, this part here, yeah, this is the. Um, Moving on, so okay, and then so continuing the, then we and then uh, we do modulate and then uh, we decode and then you get to know your original data that you sent, which is supposed to be at a very uh, low error. So yeah, you know with this system. Yeah. So the next, so how you know we are simulating this? I'm using uh, the MATLAB, and then so. So we have used the data, um, okay, frame of uh, 1,200 bit. So, and then I'm, uh, uh, um, I'm using the 1,200 by 2,400 uh, age parity matrix. So that, um, yeah. And then um, the code rate, it is uh, half. And then I'm using quasi acyclic um, ATPC code. QAM, and then the sum a product um, algorithm, hard decision, <coughs> decoding. So when we decoding, we actually you know repeat it uh, 50 times. So decoding uh, iterations are kept at 50. So now moving on, I'm going to be showing you uh, my simulation result, and then we're going to um, an an analyze them, and, and you know I'm going to explain that part. So yeah. So then. Here are my results. If you look at my uh, email, you can see here I am at, I'm setting a command six, and then command one and then this. So you can see this point here, you know, it's a very uh, low, I mean, low SSL. So, you know, to achieve, you know, this, uh, you know, this here, right here, it's really quite, um, you know, big. Um, can I say it, you know, achievement, quite big achievement, you know, to achieve this, uh, you know, it's it more than two, to achieve, you know, this area is quite big achievement. And then I'm comparing it uh, to the Adiolet card, African client, so, you know, this, 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 this you can see, this is the, the um, ATPC, which you can see, you know, the, the, you know, the curve, you know, what the curve is actually, you know, I mean, better, co you know, convex. And then you go high up, all the system program, also, you can see, no, it's still not bad, it's still okay, you know. So, I'm happy with the results, yeah. Okay, so, then next. So, now is the discussion and the conclusion. So, on my results. So, this is um, a DPC code with um, a uh, WG and noise, you know, channel. So, results are good. And then we can see that at the PCA rate of uh, 10 uh, to minus 2, uh, the IMNO, okay, is at a 4.4, and uh, for the um, uncoded data has the same PCA of uh, 10 minus 2 at the IMNO of ATP. Therefore, ATP codes have achieved a gain of 4.4 dBs. So the system is quite, you know, good, promising. When a demolition is then now changed to 64 aquam, a DPC code has the PCR rate of 10 minus 2 at the even of 
eight GPs. And the uncoded data has the same PR, I mean, the yeah, same PR, yes, but then it's at now the evening of 12 DPs. Therefore, a DP code now has a gain of 4 DP, which is also quite good. Next phase um, of the simulation, like I said earlier on, is to add the KA band a multiplicative nose vector and eventually and then, and then we're going to compare now to other codes uh, which we're going to be using now the table code to compare table code to the ATPC codes. And you expect that, you know, you know we're going to get good results as well. Yeah, so yeah. Okay. Thank you. the care band. Uh, mostly for this, I think it's to provide um, the internet. Okay. Um, and but mostly it's gonna be used uh, for broadcast as well. You know, uh, because, you know, you've seen that, you know, with uh, the DSTV, you know, mm. if it's rains, you know, I think that's, you know, I mean, it's quite bad, you know, you know so with this application, now that's, you know, that will not happen anymore. Okay. Yeah, so. Thank you so very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We have a gift presentation for our presenter. Okay, in the absence of Dr. Mulunga, uh, I will ask uh, Mr. Uh, Joe Glamini to step forward and take the uh, supervisor's gift. Oh, okay. It's very good. Thank you. Round of applause. Immediately after the next presentation, we'll be having our lunch break. So the next presentation is a performance analysis of low density parity check code for satellite communication in KA band by Mr. Jonas Dakura, the doctoral candidate in electrical engineering. A round of applause for him. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jonas Dakora, and my presentation is based on the performance analysis of low density parity check code. I think me and my colleague, uh, yeah, we are doing the same project, but we're looking at different modulation schemes. All right, so this is the outline of my presentation. Communication system use coding schemes for reliability across a noisy communication channel. If you look at the LDPC codes are in KA band, there is a lot of interference because of the high frequencies. So you need a modulation scheme that can be able to minimize your errors at very, very high frequency levels. All right, so the objectives are to develop a coding scheme technique that will be able to transmit the ADPC code over a radio communication system where the receiver is designed to iteratively decode the receive codes through the signal constellation related, to, related with the codes. And also to compute the code length at which point that your errors will be very, very minimal. So I'm looking at the code length that I'll have minimal errors. 
All right, so this is the block diagram. I'm using the relay fading channel. So you got your, gen your message generator that goes to your LDPC, then you encode it, and then you modulate it. So I'm using the binary phase shape queuing modulation scheme. All right, so this is the H parameter. This is a simple code so that I can be able to develop the generator matrix. So you look at the H parameter and then you determine at which code length that you'll be able to have minimal errors. All right, so this is the Tanner graph that I developed from the H parameter that I showed earlier on. All right, so these are the codes. This is a, an example that I use to be able to develop the generator matrix. All right, so this gives me the generator matrix from which is developed from the H, the H matrix. All right, so the encoding process, you know LDCDP codes are linear block codes which are classified as a parity check matrix H that has mostly zeros. So if you look at my H matrix, you got mostly zeros than ones. You got minimal ones and you got more zeros in the code. Right, so the generator matrix is used to determine the code rate and error, errors perf and performance. The code rate and errors performance correction by using the matrix from the parity check. So you can be able to determine the errors from the parity check matrix. All right, this is a, a standard parameters from IEEE. So if you're doing the coding, you need to choose in between these parameters. So you got the information block length, and then you got the code weight, as indicated. So this is the standard, the standard parameters that is being used for encoding and decoding. All right, here I compared the on-code. You got on-code, and then you got BP code, which is belief propagation. So those are the two that I compare in regards to the signal, the bit errors versus the signal to noise ratio. Right, the decoding process. The decoding is being implemented by using soft and hard decision. So you can decide which one best fit your application between the hard and soft decoding. So believe propagation decoder uses algorithm for all the decoding steps. This method is a sub-decoding method that is very efficient and robust method for decoding LCPD codes. All right, this is uh, the bit error versus signal to noise ratio. All right, this is the flow diagram for the encoding and decoding process. All right, the simulated results. The bit error performance of LDPZ code communication system is evaluated by using MATLAB. All right, the first figure shows the perf performance of binary phase shift queuing modulation scheme. And then the second one indicates the belief propagation decoder performance. All right, so these are three different modulation schemes that are compared. You got PBSK, PFSK, and then PASK. So those are the types of modulation schemes that are compared. And if you look at it, the, if you look at the PBSK, it goes, the signal to noise ratio, it goes 
the slope, if you look at the slope of the signal to noise ratio, the PBSK performs better than the other modulation schemes that are compared. All right, this is the bleed propagation versus the on code. All right. So basically, I'm looking at the performance of LCBD codes using binary phase shift, shift queuing modulation schemes. The influence of the code rate and code length were the main parameters that I was looking at. All right, from the simulation, we can see that the, in the case of BPSK, the LD, LDPC codes can provide a better coding gain compared with the other modulation schemes if you look at the slope. All right, so the, LCPD, the LDPC codes has the highest bit error rate slope at very high signal to noise ratio values as compared to the other modulation schemes. So oh, basically, that is the end of my presentation. So I'm just looking at the code length that I can be able to minimize the errors. No, I haven't. Okay, okay. No, thank you. Any other question? So, what kind of applications are we looking at with this type of uh, because this is still working on lower end? So, what, what, what do you have to do with this application? My frequency. I'm looking at from 25 to 30 gigahertz. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. A round of applause for me. Thanks. Uh, because we are ahead of the schedule, uh, we'll move to the next presentation. And I hope Mr. Uh, Moses is ready. OK, no problem. Let me just, uh, Mr. Moses, Tabon Koma is from DUT, uh, presenting the presentation titled Public-Private Partnership for Enhancing Border Security Through Space Technology in South Africa. Um, you. you can step forward. Um, you, you, you can take up to 30 minutes if you want. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll be presenting on Public-Private Partnership for en Enhancing Border Security through space technology in, in, in South Africa. It's based on a PhD study in business administration with my supervisor being uh, Dr. Ak Benyeka. So the study sought to examine the value of employing space technology through effective public-private partnerships to address border security limitations in South Africa. And to achieve this objective, a qualitative research methodology was applied consisting of documentary analysis and semi-structured interviews. So participants in the study were drawn from the border security environment, satellite technology. I had some researchers from, uh, I mean, employees of SANSA and uh, some professionals in the unmanned aerial system sector. So this study was purely from an applied management perspective. So you will not see the terminologies that uh, Philip has used earlier. Uh, it's, it's, it's purely applied management. So as a background, this is, I will start with the South African border environment and its challenges. And I will move into uh, the measures that are being applied at the current moment to address border security in RSA. And as a last step, I will uh, move to uh, the solutions that have been identified as uh, probably being the most effective and efficient to, to address those challenges. 
So as a sovereign state, South Africa has international borders that are well recognized by at least 200 states. Uh, it simply implies that South Africa as a state has a right to determine who enters and what enters the Republic. And it, 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 it also has that uh, prerogative to set conditions for entry and departure. So we talking of a country which has a, an area of more than 1.2 million square kilometers with a, a large bo a land border that's large and complex, uh, spanning for a distance of uh, more than 4,700 kilometers in land, which is set with six countries including Lesotho, Botswana, Namibia, Eswatini, Zimbabwe, and Mozambique. The environment is so geographically diverse and passes through most of the provinces of South Africa uh, with difficult terrain in several areas. And on the other hand, uh, South Africa boasts of a coastline of uh, 2,800 kilometers in land running from the Indian Ocean on the Sabican Sea border to the Atlantic Ocean on the Namibian Sea border. So you can see that uh, our border environment from both land and maritime, it's, it's, it's quite uh, complex, but at the same time, it provides an opportunity for, for us to leverage on the resources that we use for security and monitoring on the maritime sector. We can still use those for uh, land border, uh, looking at, at the geographical location. Uh, as you can see here, uh, on the Namibian border, we have the Atlantic Ocean, that's closer. And on the Zambi Mozambican border, it's quite problematic. We also have the Indian Ocean. Uh, I believe that there are resources at the current moment, which are used to monitor the flow of traffic, maritime traffic, and other uh, concerns in that space that can be uh, leveraged for land border security. These are the current threats and risks to border security. It's acts of criminality that are happening in the border line itself. It could be instances of house breakings, robberies, uh, arsons uh, that are happening there. But most critical, it's transna transnational organized crimes which consists of the smuggling of uh, persons, smuggling of stolen uh, vehicles, uh, as an example. We have wildlife poaching. Uh, we have crimes that involve uh, precious metals that are moved across uh, our, our land borders. You also have illegal migration or uh, border jumping. Uh, Threats of terrorism, it's, it's, it's not an actual threat, but it's, it's imminent, looking at the developments, particularly in the Mozambican area, which could have an impact on, on uh, security or national security in, in RSA. You will have technical violations. Uh, these are soft violations, illegal grazing. Uh, uh, cattle will be moved in the border of Lesotho to graze on the South African side in the afternoon, and uh, cattle is headed back into, into the city. So these are merely technical violations, but they, as, as soft as they may look, they, they, they are frustrating the farming community on the South African side, which might lead to other, uh, even though not national security issues, but other security uh, concerns here. Yeah. The current social technical aspects of border security consist of legislative and policy frameworks, about 58 legislations currently that we are implementing in the border environment, a multi-departmental approach which consists of about 16 uh, organs of state uh, operating in that environment. You will have natural barriers like your, your rivers, Calidon River, uh, Orange River, and so forth. Uh, in some areas, you have physical barriers consisting of fence, offenses, uh, 
you have patrol assets that are used by the military and the police to uh, monitor and control the, the borderline, as well as surveillance equipment uh, that's uh, used by uh, uh, organs of state in, in that regard. The challenges relating to the control and monitoring uh, the borderline uh, can be classified as follows. The length and breadth of the South Ken border, as I've mentioned, that it's more than 4,700 kilometers of the land border. An unfavorable border terrain, which makes it difficult to patrol the borderline through conventional measures, such as foot and vehicle patrols. Physical resources and human resource deficits experienced by border security authorities. This simply means that uh, there is inadequate force to space ratio to control that area. There are also ineffective border security strategies and the absence of physical barriers in most areas uh, uh, separating uh, South Africa and its neighboring countries. And the study uh, proposed a number of solutions or combinations of solutions which consists of less emphasis on human-driven approaches, integration of various surveillance and monitoring technologies, and emphasis on partnership-driven uh, uh, approaches. When we say less emphasis on human-driven approaches, the study identified that human resource constraints are a major challenge to border security in South Africa. And it also established that the current physical resources were inadequate to provide effective border security, as well as the harsh terrains and unfavorable road conditions, which makes it extremely difficult for border security to patrol using conventional measures, such as foot and vehicle patrols. In this instance, uh, we identify that uh, the use of technology might well be best suitable to address this challenge uh, of human resources uh, constraints, uh, as well as to close the gap where, uh, which are caused by harsh terrains. Uh, and, and if I may also make an example in some instances, when we do patrols, the, the, the fortunate part is that I'm, I'm uh, actively involved in that area. So when you do patrols, you will move uh, uh, as a group in vehicles. It's predetermined. Uh, organized elements will know that once we've passed, it will take us another four hours to come back. So they will capitalize on that uh, gap to launch their uh, mission. Same with, uh, if you use foot patrols, it's, 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 it's harsh terrains which uh, you cannot move with relative ease if, if you, you, you move by foot or uh, on, on, on vehicles. And another element uh, when it comes to, to human is that uh, what I was able to do 10 years ago when I was 20 years old, walking distances per foot, I would not be able to do uh, that uh, in at the current moment because of <laughs> the physical conditions and, and so forth. So you'll recruit, but in the, in the long run, the officials that we have recruited would not be suitable for that environment. So it creates a burden on, on the uh, HR system. You cannot get rid of, 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 of those officials that you have employed. So it, it, it's, it's, it's quite a, a problematic area, uh, uh, so to say. And it has also been established that uh, globally, monitoring international borders using human eyes it's, it's, it's becoming an outdated method. And it's no longer the only option that's available. Uh, uh, though it's, it's, it's still a vital component of, 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 of border security, but it cannot be solely 
based on, on that element only. And we argue that uh, the existing border security measures, uh, as I've indicated earlier, ought to be augmented by technical solutions and innovations. Uh, and the countries like the US, India, and even Egypt, they are now looking at uh, employing space technology uh, to, to monitor their international borders. And it's for that reason that even South Africa needs to consider that uh, uh, to address its uh, border security challenges. Yes, I've indicated that uh, typically this, our system is conventional and it consists of border guards and border posts along uh, international roads uh, where traffic is stopped and vehicles and passengers are inspected. I'm referring to the actual uh, points of uh, entry and exit, but also in between uh, border posts, there are border guards who do border, uh, who do border patrols uh, using existing routes at predetermined uh, intervals. So the task itself is, it involves uh, extensive human resources, even to patrol a, a, a small area, you will still need a, a lot of human and physical resources. It's a proposal, we're saying integration of technologies. Uh, technology continues to play a critical role in the delivery of various services in many industries and sectors. This includes the defense, safety, and security sectors where massive investments are made to, uh, in emerging technologies to enhance the security and defense and military capabilities of, of some of the countries. And various technologies in the form of satellites, manned aircraft, video surveillance and radars are employed by border security entities to control and monitor national territories as well as uh, unmanned aerial systems. Uh, they also form part of this combination of, of, of technologies. And they assist in doing surveillance and also in identification systems. You also have wireless sensors and ground-based electro-optical sensors, which are linked to satellites to monitor and control uh, borders. And the integration of these resources, colleagues, uh, assist in providing situa situational awareness, optimize border patrol activities, and enable uh, border authorities to react quickly to cross-border uh, criminal activities. So you are able to monitor the whole uh, border space from a centralized point if there are violations that you pick up, you are able to dispatch your uh, reactive uh, uh, teams. So these technologies are able to uh, provide a near uh, real-time detection and tracking of moving objects on the ground in a more practical and cost-effective manner and they are ideal for the monitoring of international borders, especially where uh, the area experiences frequent and significant acts of illegal uh, immigration and some other smuggling uh, activities. So you'll be able to monitor the movement along those lines uh, at a very uh, relatively uh, minimal effort, if I have to put it that way. And you are also able to uh, collect more data than you would if you use humans. Our, uh, as I've made an example that one of our safe surveillance uh, uh, method would be a, a soldier, uh, standing on top of a mountain with binoculars, 
uh, doing, uh, we call it a reconnaissance. Uh, you have to stand there for hours. And, and, and on the Lesotho side, if I have to make an example, the, the ground is higher than ours, so they are able to see you more than you, you, you can see them. So it, it actually defeats the whole purpose because while you think you are watching them, they're actually watching you. So, <laughs> so you need uh, technology to, to actually uh, assist you in that. But in the study, there were some drawbacks that we, we, we identified. Uh, particularly the use of satellites. Uh, uh, some of the experts have indicated that uh, it will not be as effective in detecting small items, such as people uh, crossing a border. It could also be difficult to discern between people and animals. But on the other hand, it was indicated that uh, maybe those drawbacks could be addressed by developing and launching a constellation of expensive satellites fitted with sophisticated high resolution cameras. Uh, that South Africa might not be in a financial position to use satellites for, for border security. These were the arguments that were presented then. I believe that there, are, uh, there could be some uh, comments here that actually dispute uh, uh, this notion. But when we look deeper into, into available rit uh, literature, we also establish that as much as uh, some of the experts have indicated that it might be expensive, uh, but the cost of launching satellites, it's, 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 it's dropping. Uh, 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 year on year. So, particularly in the field of, of, of CubeSats and NanoSats. Uh, and considering South Africa's capability of developing and launching satellite, we can uh, capitalize on that uh, to s and see if we can develop uh, tailor-made uh, solutions for, for that specific uh, uh, environment in a cost-effective way. And we're not looking at only aspects of, of border security. The environment itself is diverse. You not only have uh, the military or the police uh, in that environment, you have your environmental uh, affairs operating in that environment. So for issues of earth observation, uh, you they might also want to uh, be part of, of the whole arrangement that we, we are actually uh, proposing, as well as monitoring uh, of wildlife, like in your, your Kruger National Park. Uh, you might use the same assets that you use for border security and use it for, uh, for, for, for that uh, particular purpose. When looking at uh, unmanned area vehicles as part of the solutions, uh, one drawback that came was the issue of uh, regulatory frameworks. Uh, I think we have a stringent uh, framework which uh, regulates how uh, those assets are used in, in, that, uh, in that environment. And it could be the reason, though it was not uh, necessarily uh, highlighted as, an, as a critical element in the study, that uh, we, we, we have strict regulations which governs the use of unmanned uh, aerial vehicles, uh, which uh, the civil uh, Aviation Authority sets out condition for, for, for such use. Other drawbacks that were identified uh, related to uh, the issue of procurement, operation, and, and maintenance, uh, as well as training requirements. Uh, 
which might escalate the cost of, of using uh, those assets for, for border security. But we argue that ignoring the value that this technology could add to border security by preferring to uh, old and ineffective methods would not uh, better our position, uh, the, our current position in terms of uh, uh, managing that, uh, that space. Then we further looked at how we can uh, collaborate with the private sector in that environment to, to address the challenges that we've identified and also to provide uh, te technological solutions uh, that we have uh, identified. And we've realized that the private sector continues to play a critical role in the provision of effective technological solutions for various national security programs together with public institutions. For instance, space technology-based public partnership have been realized in strategic sectors such as the military to develop a military uh, communication systems and high-speed internet uh, to be accessed by various uh, units. And moreover, the space industry has introduced public-private partnership in space applications such as remote sensing, global navigations, and international communication system. So there's already a platform uh, uh, that we, we, we can uh, tap into uh, to, to meet our border security uh, uh, needs. And we're saying opportunity for, opportunities for uh, that particular partnership uh, should uh, not necessarily be between uh, border security entities and, and, and uh, the private uh, space uh, or technical sector, but it also needs to, to look at other private interests that are affected by border crimes. Uh, you, you have goods that are uh, trucks which carry high value assets or goods that are hijacked and uh, smuggled uh, across uh, the, the, the borders. So that affects uh, the operations of, of the private sector uh, and to which they might have an interest in, in the tracking and monitoring of, of their assets as they move uh, closer to the borders. We also have a, a strong academic fraternity which uh, operate in the space of, of space technology. I think our, some of our presenters have shown us that. We, we have a, a massive experience in that, in that area and we, we need to capitalize on that. Uh, And looking at another aspect of, 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 of the technologies that we have identified, uh, we said the skills used to develop UAVs by some companies are sourced through partnership with local academic institutions, while materials for the drones are procured from local additive uh, manufacturing competency centers attached to, to. So there is uh, a footprint uh, there. So the NFSH partnership would uh, bring a number of benefits which consist of sharing of expertise, the enhancement of border security, expedited technology innovation, and private sector uh, uh, financing. And the participants in the study have also indicated that this Partnerships with the private sector were crucial because of, uh, with regular advancements in technology, the government will not be able to work alone on te technological issues, but would rely heavily on the private sector, which is more capable and had uh, also business interest to, to control. 
as a result, there will be financial benefits uh, to those private sectors or private entities that we have identified. But there were also some drawbacks that we have identified which could inhibit the effective implementation. Uh, for instance, some participants have indicated that uh, the private sector would not be interested in engaging in such partnership due to lengthy government processes. So this calls for the limitation of government red tapes so that we, we are able to move with speed and with relative ease. Cost implications also came as a factor uh, which could uh, discourage the public sector from engaging in such a partnership. There were other issues that were raised that uh, the involvement of the private sector might compromise border security information and mission security. Issue of corruption, uh, conflict of interest, and the risks associated with the investigation partnership were some of the inhibiting factors mentioned by the participants. But these are issues that can be managed. Uh, uh, so, in conclusion, evidence in the study has really uh, suggested that there's a need to integrate various technologies including space-based technologies to enhance border security in South Africa. It also highlighted opportunities for the South African border security authorities to collaborate with the private space technology sector for the provision of space technologies to be used for uh, border security. So as a recommendation, as maybe some of you might be aware that we have established what we've called the Border Management Authority. And this provides an opportunity to review the current ineffective human-driven approaches to border security and overcome barriers of adopting technology. It can also be argued that the success of the BMA or border security authorities in South Africa will largely be dependent on the utilization of effective border security technology as identified in the study. And we also looked at uh, a possible future research, a research that will uh, identify suitable technology for the South African border environment and needs. There's also a need maybe for a a cost to benefit analysis of employing space technology for border security in South Africa. And also fully explore the possibility of cross utilization of technology for both land and maritime borders. This concludes my presentation. There's quite a lot of red tapes. Firstly, organized labor will, would be the first biggest obstacle uh, because the, the fear would be you are replacing humans with, with, with technology and you might get some resistance in that. And we know that they also survive on the numbers I mean, membership numbers. So by introducing technology, we're actually reducing uh, uh, membership. And we know that organized labor doesn't function as independent. It's also a political space, as we have indicated. 
So those are some of the obstacles that we need to, to uh, overcome uh, first uh, before we can uh, get to a point whereby the technology is well embraced and even the fixed mindset that uh, it's better to use uh, humans than, than technology, yes. Yeah. So the next presentation is by Ms. Ntum Benzintli Kwayama from DUT. She will be presenting a uh, presentation titled Converging for Human and Social Wealth in the Fourth Industrial Revolution, REM. Please step forward. <clears throat> Good day, um, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Dombezin Chegoyama. I am a student uh, from the Department of Information and Corporate Management at DUT. And today I'll be presenting my research proposal summary uh, for my master's thesis with the title being Converging Technologies for Human and Social World in the Fourth Industrial Revolution Realm. So uh, a little bit of background for my uh, proposal. Um, humans first evolved as hunter-gatherers on the savanna plains of Africa uh, 200,000 years ago. Our early human ancestors provided the skeletal and muscular structure for bipedal locomotion, sensors to detect visual, auditory, uh, haptic olfactory and gustatory stimuli and information processing abilities. In, 19, in 1781, James Watts designed a steam engine with a 10 horsepower which enabled the wide range of manufacturing to production and agricultural machinery to be powered. This ushered in the first industrial revolution since it enabled uh, the creation of, um, of mechanical energy from chemical and oxygen combustion, which could be used for a variety of movement and processing. The capacity to harness uh, mechanical energy on demand without the requirement of human, of human or chemical involvement was its revolution. In around uh, 1886, the second industrial revolution had begun uh, to arrive with industrial scale edification and electric motors. Gottlieb Daimler built the first automo automobile in 1885. And the third industrial revolution began with developments in microelectronics and semiconductors in the mid-1950s through to the early 1970s. Developments in telecommunications led to the inception of the internet by the 1990s that in the following decades saw the groundwork laid for global data centers, online marketplaces, social media, and mobile devices. The birth of World Wide Web brought with it a new syntax and protocol that enabled machinery to talk to each other and with humans. And today, uh, human enhancement is setting in and technologies are advancing at a very rapid rate. And therefore, the aim for this research is to explore the potentials of converging technologies in reshaping human beings and societies <laughs> which means uh, humans' actions and their behaviors. <clears throat> um, the ultimate goal while deciding on these uh, preferences should be human dignity and welfare and social uh, uh, wealth. So this research aims to find direction um, on the following. Can biological and virtual intelligence be developed simultaneously to enhance each other? Do convergent technologies serve only for betterment of the society? And does the enthusiasm about these convergent technologies guarantee ethics along with human and societal <coughs> world? Um, <coughs> this research that needs to be done for this problem 
can be done through uh, the use of interviews, structured interviews, which will be face-to-face, -face, computer assisted, and the potential interviewees would be professors and well-established researchers in the fields of informatics, human-computer interaction, user experience, accessibility design, biotechnology, computer science, electrical engineering, artificial intelligence, participatory democracy, and communications. Um, the arguments for and against human enhancement technologies briefly, um, I would look into uh, chip implantation, of which its most significant advantage is convenience. So um, if a person has installed a chip in their hands, uh, by convenience it means they can use it to unlock the doors, uh, use it uh, <laughs> to, <laughs> sorry. Yes, uh, that's this, this what convenience means in the statement. It also has the potential to replace all communication and sensing equipment, and its publication can actually help uh, humanity. But uh, at this point, this technology still needs to be refined and which will take some time. And also the methods of implanting the chips must take into account the physiological nature of the human body. <clears throat> Various types of physical discomforts may also occur once the chips are installed in a human body, uh, and this necessitates uh, research into appropriate, appropriate new medications uh, to be utilized in conjunction with these implantations. And as a result, this technology still confronts uh, numerous challenges. <clears throat> Um, I will give you uh, several examples of how these technologies work and how they can be used. So on the screen we see Deep Blue, um, which is a chess uh, playing computer. And in 1997, it won against the reigning world champion, which was Gary Kasparov, and it won. The second example, um, I'll have for you is the transcranial helmets, which are used for curing degenerative brain diseases, uh, which are your Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. And it can also um, control military minds, and um, it, it also used to assist uh, with memory diseases for patients. And it can also uh, allow soldiers to manipulate brain functions and to boost alertness and uh, relieve stress or even uh, reduce the effects of traumatic brain injuries. Another example is the tactile internet. And how it works is um, a human who will be uh, wearing these gloves will be actually will actually be able to to uh, have uh, the realistic experience of um, the virtual object that you see on the screen. So, if someone is wearing these gloves, it has sensors and actuators, so uh, a person will feel like they are that they are um, they are the the the, the object is on their hands. And um, it can also uh, touch, the human can also touch and interact with this virtual object uh, while experiencing this uh, haptic feedback. Another example I have is the Sophia. Sophia is a humanoid. Um, <laughs> Yes, she uh, recently made, made a statement that she, uh, is, she wants to have start a family and she wants to have a baby robot. Um, my, my next example is uh, Smart Dust. Smart Dust is a few millimeter sized device that operates individually using a, vo a very small power supply, and it consists of multiple wireless microelectromechanical systems. 
which are equipped with sensors, cameras, and other communication mechanisms. Uh, smart dust devices can collect information in circumstances where human uh, cannot easily access, um, and it can also be it can be helpful helpful in that way that it can uh, collect information in circumstances that are unreachable for humans. Uh, my last example, it's the uh, brain internet. Uh, this technology, uh, it's an open source like brain live stream. It converts uh, electroencephalogram signals into a code that displays on a website. Uh, the code allows software programs to communicate and display data on a portal. And this is currently an open website where the public can uh, observe the brain's activity. So which means uh, they'll be able to see what's happening inside a human's brain. Um, and um, instead of conclusion, technologically based predictions of the future are already threatening humanity, which is why this research is important it's potentially uh, driven to highlight further developments of virtual intelligence and convergent technologies. It aims to stand in protection of human wealth and dignity while it's not against uh, the technological development for the betterment of both society and individuals. Um, one must keep in mind when developing these technologies, human dignity and social wealth. There is no happy society without happy individuals. I would like to thank uh, Professor Bock and Prof. Davidson for sharing with me their inspirational ideas and supporting uh, me into conducting my research in this topic. Thank you. So smart dust collects uh, information, as I've mentioned, where uh, humans don't have access, cannot access. So it can also be uh, put inside your body to collect that information. So wherever uh, humans cannot access that, that's the use of it to, to collect that information. Information and corporate management. Information and corporate management. Yes. Yes, uh, I am further going to look into uh, the other aspects. Uh, uh, today, I was presenting my research proposal uh, uh, presentation. So, uh, and I would appreciate more comments to help me uh, to get direction as well for further uh, research. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.
So, so we we'll take one more presentation before Professor Davidson comes on board. Uh, the last presenter on the program here is uh, Miss Ndosiwe Malanda from DUT. She'll be presenting the presentation titled Transient Fault Analysis of a VSC-based Multi-Terminal HVDC Scheme, Space Power Systems. Ms. Malanda, you can please step forward. Um, greetings to the program director, professors, and the fellow researchers. Um, my name is uh, Cindy Siwe Malanda, and um, <coughs> today I'll be talking about the Transient Fault Analysis of a VSC-based uh, multi-terminal HVDC schemes. I think I pressed the wrong thing, okay. Um, so here's the little overview of what I'm gonna be discussing today. Um, I'll have the introduction um, and it covers the background study, problem statement, aim and objectives, research questions, the significance of the study, research contributions and limitations. And then it will be followed by the literature review and I'll move on to mathematical modeling, development of MTDC, H, uh, VSC, HVDC model, um, results, discussion and uh, the conclusion. <coughs> so, um, we as a country, we, 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 we all know what um, problems are we facing currently, uh, problems such as uh, power instability, uh, which uh, leads to uh, periodic load shading. I'm sure we, <laughs> we are aware of that. We've been suffering from that for the past um, uh, weekend. So um, I'd like to move on to the ESCOM now. Um, we know that ESCOM is heavily dependent on coal as, it, as it's a primary source of electricity due to large scale reserves. And um, these instabilities are normally caused by uh, the high population uh, growth, rapid economic um, expansion, uh, load growth, and et cetera. They are not limited to this. There are so many um, uh, causes of these um, uh, power instabilities. <clears throat> so um, features or qualities of a standard and a reliable power grid uh, should be as follows. Uh, first, the grid voltage generated should be within the limit. Uh, transmission lines must be able to retain stability during fault. It must not be overloaded and uh, the grid must be able to withstand the loss of a generator. And uh, lastly, uh, the generator capacity must be greater than the demand. So um, here in South Africa, we not only are generating power for ourselves or we're not using the only power that we are generating. South Africa is um, also interconnected uh, through the transmission lines uh, with our neighboring countries, which are um, uh, Mozambique, for instance, we have the HVDC transmission lines, uh, which is uh, rated as 533 kV. And we have uh, Swaziland, Namibia, uh, Botswana, which they are all um, rated at 400 kV, and they are using HVAC lines. And then we have Lesotho, which is rated at 132 kV. And presently, um, Green energy is linked to high uh, voltage direct current, which is HVDC, and uh, DC grids uh, to um, incorporate the large scale renewable energy plants. Moving to Africa, um, we know that Africa has um, high potential of power, of, I mean, of uh, primary sources of energy, such as um, oil, gases, coal here in the southern region and the hydro resources which are available in the central region. 
which means we have um, a high potential of um, power. So now uh, the possible uh, developments of the uh, wind power, hydroelectric project, and uh, the solar can sufficiently electrify the whole of Africa and can even trade to European countries. And the proposal of, of um, integrating the African power grid into a smart integrated um, Africa electric power super grid through the use of HVDC technology will enable the large penetration of renewable um, power without compromising uh, the power system, active and reactive power, uh, power quality, and the voltage stability. But now, the problem uh, with these uh, renewable resources is that they are found far from the load centers, which brings a problem because uh, this power must be transmitted in the most reliable and efficient way. So, what's the, uh, the solutions to that? We have um, HVDC transmission uh, system, which is the preferred um, system of transmitting these uh, high voltage, um, high voltages or power. So um, HVDC has um, few, or should I say the advantages uh, uh, why we prefer them over H HVAC. It's because they have the minimal um, harmonic oscillation problems due to the absence of uh, frequencies, and also it can interconnect uh, the network which have different frequencies. So there are two types of um, HVDC transmission system which can be employed um, in a medium and the high voltage system, and they are a VSC, which is the volt, uh, voltage source converter, and uh, the LCC, LCC, which is the line commutated converter. Uh, presently, or should I say the most newest uh, technology is uh, the VSC, which uses the IGPT switches, which are insulated gate bipolar transistors. So just like any other system, um, VSC HVDC system has several advantages. Uh, we're looking at the uh, lower losses, uh, the black start capability. Uh, it has the uh, it it has um, it can control uh, the reactive and active power independently, and it has the grid access uh, for weak network and uh, it can be configured into a multi-terminal system, and lastly, it, um, it has low environmental impact. So, VSC has the power reversal capability, of which uh, um, it's the one that led to the establishment of MTDC network like supergrids. So uh, MTDC system can be configured as uh, the two-level VSC topology or the half-bridge um, uh, multi <coughs> uh, ha half bridge uh, multi-level modular converters, and there are already existing networks which are um, which are uses uh, two-level topology and um, HPMMC. But now the problem with uh, the VSC, as much as it has a lot of advantages, there's uh, one major problem uh, with the VSC um, uh, converters is that they are prone to DC line fault. Uh, <coughs> and then uh, high fault current has the possibility of damaging the system's equipment, uh, such as uh, insulation of the cables, IGPT switches, and it also destroys the diode of the converter terminal. So uh, for matter terminal to be developed successfully, a detailed analysis of four um, key aspects is required, namely uh, dynamic behavior, fault behavior, power flow control, and lastly, it's uh, system integration. A VSC MTDC network has a great flexi uh, flexibility for large-scale renewable 
energy integration. However, MTDC protection is still a major problem. As I've mentioned before that due to um, DC fault, it, uh, they become uh, limited or there's a limitation in um, development of MTDC. And uh, I have figure one, which uh, shows the link between uh, the Namibia and Zambia, and it's the first um, African VSC-based uh, transmission system, which was commissioned in 2010, and the name of the system is Caprivi Link. <coughs> so, moving to the problem statement. There's still a large percentage of Africans which uh, doesn't have access into electricity. And this also affects our economic growth as the continent. However, we have uh, renewable sources in Africa, as I've mentioned before, we have oil, we have hydro, we have coal in the Southern Africa, meaning we can have, or rather we can introduce the energy mix which will integrate all these resources to our um, existing grid. But now the problem is that these resources they are far from the load centers and it's a very long distance which um, HVAC cannot be used. So HVDC uh, transmission system presents minimal transmission losses compared to HVAC. It also has low cost um, over the long distances and are environmental friendly. So presently VSC uh, based HVDC technology is used for HVDC uh, projects. They are no longer using LCC. It's more like it's, it's outdated and it has um, lots of drawbacks compared to VSC. So now, for the MTDC to be realized, there are some uh, things that needs to be done. For instance, I've mentioned that uh, uh, the IGPTs, they are, are vulnerable when it comes to uh, DC site fault. So for this system to be developed, a thorough understanding of the behavior of the system needs, uh, needs to be done so that they will be able to come up with the protection of this system. So um, the analysis of the fault, it's very, very, very important. So uh, the aim of this research is to investigate, <coughs> uh, sorry, um, the aim of this report, uh, of this uh, study is to analyze the transients at the C fault in a two level monopolar VSC-based multi-terminal HVDC schemes, which uh, consist of uh, four asynchronous terminals sharing the rated voltage of 400 kV on the DC side. And uh, the research ob objectives are given as follows. I have uh, six of them, which are listed here. Uh, number one, to develop a VSC-based MTDC HV, um, HVDC system test model using the PSCAT software packaging. Uh, number two, to investigate the transient fault and uh, their influencing felt, uh, factors in multi-terminal HVDC network. That leads to analyze the influence of the components, main parameters on the transient fault current development during pole to ground fault, as well as the interaction between the components by means of simulation and uh, we'll further analyze and understand the concept of voltage source converters and its behavior. And lastly, I will identify and quantify the major fault current um, influencing factors. Um, for example, transmission technology, uh, network grounding systems, and network topology. And then in the literature, I covered um, the overview of HVDC transmission system, uh, which is number one, the configuration. There are two configuration, there are two possible uh, configuration, which is the bipolar and the monopolar, and it's uh, depicted in figure two, from figure 2A to figure 2D. And then I have the components which are 
be, which makes uh, the convector station. Uh, it includes the grid, obviously the grid should be there, uh, the transformer, the filters, uh, the phase reactor, and the IGBT valves, and lastly it's uh, the DC side um, cables or DC lines. And then figure four shows uh, the PQ circle diagram for the VSC converter. As I've said, um, the VSCs, they have a capability of, um, <clears throat> of uh, forward and reverse power flow. The power flow can be reversed. Uh, it's one of the reasons why we are having MTDC is because there's a reversal power flow. And then lastly, um, it's the technique, modulation technique, and we're gonna be using the pulse width uh, modulation. And then looking into figure six, we have the main and the control block diagram for a VSC converter using the vector control technique. So vector control technique is um, divided into two parts. We have the inner current controller and the outer controller. As for the outer controller, we have um, figure seven, which is the voltage droop controller, which helps uh, the lines to maintain uh, their nominal voltage because on the DC line, the voltage must be maintained, the range must be maintained. Um, normally, it's, um, they give 5% tolerance. So we use the, uh, you implement the, the voltage droop in the system to make sure that uh, your voltage is within the range. And then we have our grid topologies. Uh, there's uh, four of them. We have radial, we have densely meshed, we have lightly meshed, and we have the ring structure. And they are all uh, depend on the security, reliability, and the cost. Looking into figure eight and figure nine, we have um, types of um, faults which can occur on the system, which is the line to ground fault and line to line fault. These are possible faults. Um, and then we have in figure 10, the potential ending points of the DC convector system, which is shown there, it can be earth uh, between the two capacitors with the impedance, or it can be earth without the impedance, or it cannot be earth at all. Uh, moving into mathematical modeling, uh, the basic operating principle of a two-level converter. Um, first, we have um, the AC side uh, dynamics, which are um, modeled use, uh, which are modeled using equation one. And then we have the transients um, on the AC side, which are described by equation two. And we have the three-phase convector volt voltages and currents, which are expressed in a DQ reference frame using um, uh, APC to DQ. That is for the control purposes because we can't use um, all three phase, instead we use two. So we have to convert um, our lines, our three phase line into um, two signals, which is the DQ transformation, uh, rotating uh, synchronously at the given um, AC frequency. And the equations are there, equation three and equation four. And then figure 11 shows the schematic uh, uh, representation of the VSC HVDC system. And uh, equation five, six, and seven, they are used to model the DC line uh, dynamics. <coughs> so um, the development of the MTDC VSC HVDC model is shown in figure 12. It's, a, it's a, a complete structure which was proposed. Um, and then um, table one shows uh, the test model parameters which um, they are used in PSCAT 2. And uh, figure 12, the test model is designed to be a radially meshed MTDC and is conf uh, configured to be a symmetrical monopolar based in two-level VSC converter topology. So figure 13 
I was just um, showing the rectifier side um, of the two level VSC HVDC based uh, model, um, which is simulated on the PSCAD. And then figure 14 to figure 17 basically just shows um, how I modeled the system. It's the uh, cables, it's the control uh, side, which shows the inner and the outer controller um, of the system. And then it shows uh, the frequency triangular um, carrier waveform, which is compared with the fundamental waveform, that is the modulation part of the system. And then um, the results. Firstly, I simulated this system during the steady state um, operation, which we have the figure 19 showing the active uh, power waveforms. Excuse me. And then uh, figure 20 shows the reactive power waveforms. Uh, figure 21 and figure 22, it shows uh, the DC grid waveform for all uh, four terminals. And then 20, 22 is just showing uh, one terminal, the positive and the negative terminal of the DC lines. Uh, then uh, figure 23, it shows the measured current from the DC cables. And figure 24, it shows the current from the bus terminals. As you can see from uh, the bus terminals, it's 0 0.5 kA, whereas on the, um, the DC cable, it's 0 0.25, so it's half of the 0 0.5. And then uh, figure 25, it shows 0 because there is no... Uh, power in, in those uh, converters, it's supposed to be zero. And then figure 26, it shows the AC current from AC uh, grid to the converter, which is um, the converter two of the system. And then uh, figure 27 shows the capacitor current. Uh, figure 28, it shows um, the diode current. So now moving to um, the transient response of the pole to ground DC fault. Um, figure 29 and to figure 34, it shows how the system reacts when there is a fault in a system. So because of uh, the droop control, you can see there in figure 29, the DC, the DC voltage uh, during the fault, that there is uh, a slightly drop there, but because of the droop, it didn't go up to zero. It still managed to withstand the range of um, the rated uh, voltage. And then uh, figure 30, you can see there, um, normally the previous slide, okay. On slide 22, it shows the positive 200 and the negative 200 during the steady state um, conditions. But now, because of the fault, we, we can see one side, it goes to zero, and the other pole is trying to keep the rated voltage, which is 400 kV. Uh, it can be done on, on the simulation, but on, um, on the existing uh, network, we are still not sure if really it can be that efficient. And then uh, figure 31, it shows the DC fault current, which is uh, measured 10 kilometers away from uh, um, station one. And because the fault, it was inserted close to the converter. That's why we see for the current, which is um, for VSC one is very high because the fault is closer to that terminal, whereas at the terminal, the current is still high, but it's uh, lesser compared to the one close to the converter. And then uh, figure 32, it shows uh, the DC fault current measured uh, 50 kilometers away from VSC1. So now we can see the difference between um, the time when the fault was inserted in uh, figure 31, which was close to VSC1, 
and now it's further away, it's uh, 50 kilometers, we can see the difference from the result that if the fault is away from the terminal, as much as the, it, it will impact the system, but it will be better compared when the fault is closer to the terminal. And then figure 33, it shows the anti-parallel uh, anti parallel diodes current measured 10 kilometers away from uh, VSC1, and we compare them from um, the anti-parallel diode currents measured uh, 50 kilometers away from VSC1. So from those two figures, again, you can see the, the difference of, 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 of current. The magnitude is higher when the fault is closer to the converter. And then uh, this is my conclusion, and I'm ready for questions. Thank you. <clears throat> Um, this uh, study was done only on the simulation, so there was no practical Im implementation. So it wasn't really a problem to get this high um, uh, currents from the faults. <laughs>